All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Interesting episode here today. This is a much requested episode. We deal with human health primarily, but the same basic principles apply to animals as well. And we do get quite a few dogs and cats and horses and I'm even asked about snakes and such sometimes. So here we're talking about animals. We're talking about pet nutrition. And I've actually kind of changed my opinion on this over the years. Our guru, our mentor, Dr. Joel Wallach, is well known for saying that uh, because he started as a veterinarian, he's well known for saying that he treats humans like dogs and they get better. <laughs> but in this day and age, things have changed in the dog food industry. It's no longer as reliably nutritious as it once was. And many of the same problems in dog foods are the same problems in human foods. Having said that, overall, there's still actually more nutrients in your dog or cat food than there is in your baby food, which is, you know, a criminal problem to me. But there's major problems with dog food, and we are going to talk about some of that. Dogs are subject to all the same problems as humans, and in recent years... We have seen a lot of unhealthy dogs. I myself was in the pet business a lifetime ago. We got out during the Great Recession of 2008. But uh, around that time, the dog industry in Canada and cat industry changed where they made it illegal to sell dogs in pet stores. So it went all into private breeders. Mm -hmm. And a big part of the argument here was that the industry was dominated by, quote, puppy mills. You know, a bunch of dogs in kennels and they were only being fed kibble and they weren't being walked and all this stuff. And, and that's not good. But when it went into the hands 100 percent private, a lot of those private breeders, especially with the purebreds, got them on raw food. And then what we saw in Canada is basically an epidemic of retarded dogs. Wow. Don't, don't mean to be rude. Retarded is a uh, technical word. It means underdeveloped. So we, we still have this problem in Canada, honestly. I wouldn't buy a purebred, no way, especially not in the hands of a private breeder. And I've got nothing against private breeders. In fact, they're the, some of the most caring, empathetic people ever. They love their animals, but they're just not trained in nutrition, just like human doctors. They're not trained in nutrition. So we've seen many of the same problems with childhood diseases and human diseases has cropped up now in the animal industries and a big part of that is getting them off of kibbles. And although there is problems with kibbles, I do believe that the raw food movement has done more harm than the kibble industry, to be honest. We're going to talk a little bit about this. I've adjusted my opinion on this. Previous, I used to say, and Dr. Wallach used to say that dog food is better than raw food. Now I do believe that we have to combine both theories. We should be using real foods, non-processed foods, as much as possible, because processed foods cause problems in animals and they cause problems in humans. But we also have to implement supplementation. That's the best thing that the animal industry actually did. And for the most part, we've conquered almost every single disease in the animal industries, if you did not know. Arthritis and diabetes and cancer and all this stuff. In almost every breed that you can name, well, every breed that you can name of animal, every species of animal, this has been conquered. It's just in the pet industry, the dogs and cats, especially the most common pets, their foods have changed. And the industry has gotten lax on some things and there's some things missing from their foods and there's some problems. We're going to talk about all of this today. And with me here is my friend and colleague. Tamra, Coach Tamra. Hi and there. <laughs> she's an animal lover. So yeah. we're gonna we're gonna take it from the top here, but I want to start with Tamra herself. You've got a little bit of an interesting journey into health yourself. What happened? I do. Okay. So, you know, growing up, I think I had ADHD, ADD, climbing up walls, totally hyper, couldn't focus. My mom threw me in gymnastics. I I just remember you know, doing gymnastics every day, 5.30 to 9.30 from probably 10 on, 10 years old on, quit gymnastics at 13 because my body was falling apart. Um, you know, we didn't know how to eat. Uh, went into dance. I was a dancer, uh, athlete. 
Um, and then by the time I got to high school, um, I was kind of like a very strong person because of gymnastics, I think, you know, always working out, lifting weights, thought I was healthy, but I was getting sick a lot. You know, I had a lot of um, bronchitis, tonsillitis. By the time I was in high school, um, I remember getting really sick uh, with mono. Um, by the time I was 17, I remember having my wisdom teeth out. And I got an infection and some nerve damage here. It was a big infection. It lasted a year. They bombarded me with like 10 months of uh, penicillin. The infection was popping through my teeth. From that point on, I always felt like I was always muscling through um, dance or or whatever. And you're young, you can kind of power through it. But I always just felt tired and um, just, God, does everyone feel like this? And then, you know, fast forward, you know, my late 20s. Um, I ended up having um, cervical cancer, uh, advanced endometriosis. I had Epstein-Barr fibromyalgia. And uh, a couple of years before I found out this diagnosis, you know, I became a personal trainer and I was doing the high protein diet. So no doctor was able to help me, right? Um, no one talked about nutrition. At 24, they cut out my tonsils um, because I was always getting, you know, tonsillitis and all that stuff, pneumonia a few times. And then um, 27, I started going more the holistic holistic route, right? So I was searching. Um, uh, that's what led me to a holistic doctor in Orange County, California. Um, and uh, she had, you know, at least found the Epstein bar. And, um, you know, previous to that, I had gone to psycho psychiatrist and they had put me on antidepressants, just telling me I'm depressed and it's in my head and blah, blah, blah. So that led me to um, Dr. Morse, who I don't know if you, I think you're aware of Dr. Morse and detoxification and, um, you know, Morse, raw food. Yeah. And that. yeah. So that was finding him was kind of the beginning of for my understanding of just eating, you know, foods that are healthier. <laughs> um, so when I was really, really sick, I was searching and I ended up going down to Florida and um, just started to eliminate, you know, all the, a lot of the bad foods I was eating, right? I felt better. I, I detoxed. I ended up having a really major healing crisis. Um, it lasted about four weeks. I had pneumonia. I remember coughing up black blood and mucus, like just getting whatever that guck is out. And then about four weeks later, I never had a granular fever. I really feel like I somehow detoxed Epstein-Barr out of my system. I felt great. Um, then I got really passionate about, you know, getting into this lifestyle, helping other people. But meanwhile, at the same time, um, you know, animals have always been my love and my teachers. As a child, they're like my best friends. And um, while I was going through all this, like trying to find my way through my health issues, I couldn't really work anymore. I couldn't do personal training. I, I, I just couldn't. I just didn't have the energy. So I was like, I can't do nothing. What am I going to do? Okay, what's my second love? And I love, I love animals. So okay, I, while I'm sick, while I feel like I can't really get a job somewhere, I'm going to start a nonprofit. So I started a nonprofit with the um, LA uh, dog trainer around here. And it, this is about 2003, four. I was also doing a lot of fostering of dogs and getting into that because, you know, I wanted to contribute. And so while I was also finding my way through detox and, and, and trying to heal myself, um, I started to apply what I was learning to the pets, right? It got me really passionate. And so I would start, you know, in the beginning I was into, you know, the whole alkalizing thing and the high raw and with the dogs, I always knew that, you know, there was a whole thing about dogs should be vegan or in the raw food world, they can have fruit. And I never bought into all that because I was like, well, they're different than we are. So they, you know, they eat that in the wild. But I started implementing like herbs and detoxification principles that I was learning. And I saw a miraculous change in the outcome, right? Um, so I feel like I've, I've gone through like everything. I did everything the vets did. I thought I was the best dog mom to incorporating, you know, I'd started with maybe a better kibble back in the day, which I didn't know. And then, you know, some canned food. And then I tried the vegan thing for the raw a while. And then I did the raw and I thought the raw was the perfect thing. You know, um, I saw the dogs doing really well, but, um, and until honestly, until about two years ago, you know, I was a vegan for, it's been, I guess, 17 years I was a vegan and I thought I was healthy. Although really, if I look at it now, 
I had I was gaining weight, um, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, I know, I don't know if you guys know Dr. Reese, but he helped me. I had, you know, had a health crisis and uh, reached out to him because he's also, you know, uh, studied with Dr. Morris. And he's, he's the one that started sharing with me about Dr. Wallach's work and Dr. Glidden. And I went down that rabbit hole. And so it's completely changed my life. And like you, um, there's layers to things. I thought that the detox was the be all end all. Um, and you know, how could I be eating all these organic raw foods and be this sick and be unhealthy more, you know, lost half my hair. So, um, my whole journey in the last, I guess, 25 years has been, you know, taking the information and applying it and, and continually learning. So I ended up doing um, consultations for people worldwide since about 2013, um, all over the world. I've done consultations with mostly dogs, some cats, a, a few horses, um, you know, just applying herbs and, you know, a, a better diet. But until, you know, two years ago, I really had to like pivot from my belief system, you know, and that was really hard. Um, and, and especially at the same time, animals have always been my teacher. So when this was happening, my three dogs who've also been raw fed were having, all of them were having symptoms at the same time, right? One of them had in, was getting incontinent. The other one, um, really bad arthritis. The other one had a, a kidney stone. Right. And I was like, how could this be? So because they they seemed like they were doing better than all the other dogs in the past that were feeding while I was feeding canned or kibble or whatever. Um, so that made me step back and look at the importance of supplementation, which I never believed in. I believed we can get everything from our food. I throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Without understanding. So that's kind of my story in a nutshell. <laughs> that's kind of make me come full circle. Um, if that makes sense. No, oh, you're frozen. It's, it's an, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm here. Sorry. So I was, uh, I was looking for today, by the way, there was a huge internet outage. I know this video is not going to post for a while, but uh, today there was a huge cell phone and internet outage. And actually my computer has been acting up all day. I've had to restart it like eight times oh, no. while, while I've been working. Oh, so no. I was just uh, looking for a video that I know I've posted at least twice. It, it's a, a video of, I'll probably paste it in here, of carnivore animals eating fruits and vegetables, and then herbivore mm -hmm. animals eating birds, eggs, mice. So there's, a lot yeah. of there's a lot of misconceptions about what animals actually eat. And I've heard people say, oh, well, gorillas just eat leaves. No, they don't. All primates. You know, I believe I believe that for years when I was a vegan with all those people giving those seminars. Oh, no, the primates don't eat anything but fruit. I really I believed it. I truly believed I could be vegan and thrive. I really did. And they're just those they're incorrect. Correct. Most primates will eat basically anything that moves, you know, little little birds, little rodents, insects, eggs, anything they come across that, that is edible. They will eat it. Rotting fish, you know, a lot of these. Primates will eat them. Even the so-called leaf-eating monkeys will eat more than leaves, yes. And it's yeah. also true that even uh, ruminant animals like cows and goats, yep, they will gobble up a mouse if they come across it, an egg. They will they'll chew on bones and clay and stuff, especially if they're mineral deficient. Just herbivores aren't strictly herbivore and carnivore aren't strictly carnivore. Yeah. Basically, any animal, especially out in the wild, will eat almost anything it can. And we all know dogs, they'll go and they'll eat grasses and herbs and they'll drink from puddles, which are much more mineral rich than the tap water we give them. They know what they're doing. They're looking for nutrients. Yeah. So it's a huge misconception out there that any of the animals are strictly this or strictly that. Most of them are omnivorous. Most animals on this earth are omnivorous. And the ones that are not do not live very long. Yeah. So I think this is a fairly important point here as well, especially when it comes to dogs. Dogs are very similar to humans anatomically, believe it or not. Their digestion tract is very similar to humans. Primates, dogs, and pigs, very, very similar. And they all are omnivorous. Dogs are largely carnivore, but that's also sort of just a matter of their lifestyle. But they will chew on this and that. And if they do find fruits, they will eat them, especially when they drop to the ground. 
near the end of the summer, they will absolutely eat them. We've all seen our dogs do this, right? So one thing to note is that a lot of these lifespans of animals are not very impressive. The human species has beaten basically every other animal. There's only a few exceptions, like some whales, you know, but whales live in the sea. All the minerals are in the sea. And it's not comparable anatomically to, to us at all. But any animal that is in the same range as us, even things like elephants and rhinos, we, we beat all of these animals. And I'm pretty sure it's because of our brain, because we are able to consume a wider variety of foods. But also there's this thing called the great leap forward. This is relevant for pets, I promise. There's this thing called the great leap forward where a lot of... Uh, intellectuals think that humans discovered fire and therefore that allowed us to eat a wider variety of foods. Now we come in and say, actually the fire gave us ashes. We had ashes left over, which is concentrated plant derived minerals. Humans are creatures of habit. They would throw those ashes in roughly the same place every day. And I'm sure somebody noticed eventually that the plants grew better there. I'm sure somebody noticed that the white ashes tasted pretty good and that they could eat it, and that they could add it to some of their foods as a condiment and as a thickener, especially as we started cooking and got metal and all this stuff, which also came from fire. I'm just saying that extra mineral source and some of our brain power and being able to scavenge a couple more things and, you know, certain foods are more absorbable with their vitamins when they're cooked and stuff like that. And, you know, we can crack open bones and get the bone marrow out. Other species can as well. But just saying our brains gave us access to more nutrients, especially in the fire aspect. And our dogs have been along this journey most of the time as well, as far as evolutionary theorists are concerned. So I have a big feeling that the reason that our dogs can live longer than a wolf or a coyote, because both of those animals max out around 14 years. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that in, uh, in, in the wild, in captivity, some of them can do longer, but still... I have a feeling that our dogs are living longer than their wild counterparts because they have access to some of our smarter concentrated sources of minerals too. You've probably seen dogs lick the fire pit and stuff. And a lot of people say, get out of there. Stop looking. But they know what they're doing. And uh, this is one of the reasons that domesticated dogs, I think, can live so long, even with the problems with dog foods, because they do have these extra concentrated nutrient sources in it. It's pretty yeah. hard work to get all that out in the wild. And I'm going to throw it back to you, talk a little bit about uh, dog and cat nutrition. But I just want to say, too, that my mom's dogs that I grew up with, they lived, this is a Jack Russell and then a, a larger mutt. They both lived to about 18, 19, 20. We're not 100% sure of their ages. They lived on the cheapest dog food available. Whatever was on sale, my mom bought. And, you know, just... Kind of like a car. We bought beat up cars and we use cheap gas and they live, they, they run as long as they run. We don't really care. Dogs did fine all the way until the end. Of course, by the end, they had cataracts and lumps and they're peeing on the floor and stuff. But they, they lived a long time. They live a lot longer than a wolf. And we did give them table scraps too. This is something we say not to do. And I want to get into that with a couple of the longest live cats and dogs on record. Because I think I've changed my opinion slightly on that. But yeah, we, <laughs> we broke the rules. We broke the rules. We gave them the cheapest dog food. They had grains in them. They're super ultra processed. Like we're talking about old Roy from Walmart and whatever else was on sale at the cheap no name grocery stores and stuff like that. And yeah, table scraps and not I'm not talking about good organic wholesome table scraps. I'm talking about processed food. We grew up on processed food. We fed that to the dogs too. If they wanted it, go ahead. Have a pop tart. Honestly. We didn't know any better, and those dogs still lived quite a long time. I find that interesting, but I think the situation is a little bit worse now, and especially if the dog is sick, these rules no longer apply. You have to change things. You know, if you got some hardy dogs, you got good luck. Yeah. And that's a different story, but what do you think about this? What's your journey with animal foods and animal husbands? You no, know, I think that's been the biggest challenge because we know that there's so many uh, marketing gimmicks, you know? Um, we know that like they'll throw grain free on certain things or, you know, um, you've, you've, and then you've got the raw foods to some of the raw foods that are, they're trying to be better, but they're not supplemented at all. Right. I think I've maybe found two on the market that are raw 
or or they're lightly cooked and they're um, or they're like the freeze dried, you know, that don't have a lot of the water in it that have some supplementation. It's it's challenging for people because they want a lot of people. They love their pets, but they like the convenience. It's just ingrained into them to throw down the kibble. Oh, it's you know, and then and then I find too with clients I've worked with around the world that they're scared because this whole idea of that you have to have this complete diet scares them into thinking they can't do it themselves, right? So then they rely on what their vets are telling them to eat, which some of those foods are are awful. The um. The science diet and the Royal Canaan, I mean, it's just got, it's just not a lot of nutrients, even though they are, they do have minerals and all that stuff in it. Um, but um, it's a challenge to find a good food. And then like, I'll find one and I'm always trying to like, if I'm, you know, like I want to do raw. And then I, now that I understand supplementation, I'm supplementing because I feel like, I mean, I give my dogs liver caps, liver, you know, they have to have the bone. There's a whole stuff that they need to have. And I always tell people, it's not that hard if they're in the wild and they're going to go have like, you know, a little squirrel. I mean, how much organs are in and how much bone for their diet? It's not, you know, brain science, but I think people are really scared. And then they just go back to the kibble because they get overwhelmed, right? There's so much information out there. So that's always been the challenge for me or the fact that people just don't want to, they don't want to do it. And they, you know, and I'm always been for a search for like, I found this one company in Utah and it's all wild, um, like rabbit, uh, bison, um, and it's, it's all lean, you know, um, cause a lot of these raw foods, the one thing that I have found is that like, you know, they have the minimum requirement of like the crude fat or whatever, which they have to meet, right. The AFCO or whatever standards, well, that's the minimum. They could have like, it could be like 90% fat and we don't know it. So anything in excess can be bad for us. So I always find too that I've seen so many of these pets, they're eating so much of these raw food companies and then they're getting pancreatitis and then they're bile vomiting, you know, and it's just sometimes I think over excessive, you know what I mean? It's like, we've kind of gone extreme. And so, yes, we need to come and bridge in the middle and be like, okay, like the canned foods, also my problem is mixing a lot of the starches and the proteins, right? Like is that's hard for a lot of these dogs. A lot of these dogs are um, compromised with their GI tracts, I find, you know, or they're malabsorbed. Just and like so, humans. Exactly. And so when they're eating these foods that have high, high starch in it and the meat, you know, especially the kibbles, I think, okay, if I were making a kibble, I look at the ingredients, right? And then I'm like, okay, so there's all these starches, there's meat here, but if you're cooking it at 400 degrees or a couple times for a shelf life, what does your food look like? It's basically like probably 75% carb carbs. You're pretty much probably giving, feeding your dog mostly a vegan diet in a way, mm -hmm. you know, that's how I kind of look at it. And it's just, for me, it's trying to educate people into understanding how to read the labels and what these things mean and whole ingredients are better and so it's a, it's a process, you know, I still, I, I still find it ch challenging to, to get someone not to be overwhelmed by everything that's out there, you know? Absolutely. And so I, what do you think you get a dog as a puppy? What, what would you do right now? Knowing what you know? Now, what I would do <laughs> is I would probably put it on a raw diet but I would supplement and make sure that they have everything that they need. And if there's like the, there's a company, I don't know if I should name names, but there's a one that I found the closest one that I can find that has that's raw and that supplements is open farm. But again, it's actually, I have it right here. It's this grass fed beef one. And it's not like frozen or, you know, raw, but at least it's got supplementation, right? it's expensive. Most, a lot of people might not be able to afford it. I've got little dogs. There was a time where I had a, a wolf hybrid, a Husky and a, a Malamute. Um, and I was spending a thousand dollars a month on raw meat. Jeez. Now I was also using a lot of herbs and, you know, I, I felt like they were doing better, better to an extent, but, um, you know, one of my dogs got bone cancer. I had an amputator leg. It was awful. Um, I had a lot of success with my Husky. He, he was on, um, he was hypothyroid for five years and he was on the Siloxine. And I started getting him on the raw food diet with the herbs. And I started doing some glandular therapy with him. And I was able to get him off his meds within three months. Whereas the vets are like, you can never do that. And so I've seen what's possible with the diet. It's just that, you know, 
for me, I feel like after about seven or eight years, it's kind of like the vegan thing. I felt great the first five years, but then long-term you start falling apart. It's the same thing with a raw food diet, right? For the dogs, mm -hmm. because they got to make sure they're having other stuff. So one of the things I found worked for me, and this was just something from trial and error, because I'm always trying to learn and adapt and grow and, you know, just keep myself on my toes is um, what worked for me until, you know, recent is I would do... Um, like four raw meat days and then maybe a couple fruit days, or I would do maybe a sweet potato, you know, like I would, I would offset the amount of fat they were having. Um, and I was also going through a company that's out in San Diego that basically, um, you know, grinds the, the food and puts a little bit of veggies in it. Um, and that seems to be fine, but I do feel like it's too fatty. You know what I mean? And so then you're having that excess fat is causing problems. So this is kind of what I'm found on. I'm always trying to, you know, adjust. And, you know, the other thing is too, is when I work with clients, it's like, you know, um, they condition their dogs because they're giving them treats or whatever. So, you know, I believe in fasting too. Like I tell people, like, if you can fast your dog one day a week, I think it's great for them. You know, I really am an advocate of that. Or, you know, do a day, do a day of fruit just to offset all this stuff. And one of the reasons I started doing that is probably because of my background with, I think fruit is okay for dogs. And then I studied the, um, I was starting to pay attention to the Wolf Voyager project. And they were showing that like during um, certain seasons, the wolves were eating like 80% uh, berries, even when there was other foods around and they were thriving and it, it was seasonal, you know, not to say, you know, a dog can live on fruit because unfortunately I know people in the raw food world that it killed me. They were just feeding their dogs fruit for a year and these dogs looked terrible and they just thought they were detoxing, detoxing, detoxing. So this, um, this idea of detox is also being done with pets and it's, it's, it's scary. You know, we've got both sides <laughs> like, you know, I'm always trying to bridge the two because it makes sense to me in the wild. Like, you know, they're going to, they've seen wolves climbing trees and eating apples, you know, but yeah, their diet is, is primarily, you know, the kill, you know, I don't, I'm not a big vegetable person with the dogs. I think it's fine with fiber. I don't think it's going to hurt them, but you know, you just kind of have to find what works. And I think, um, older dogs have different situ Everyone has a little different situation, just like people, you know? So that's kind of how I work um, and what I found to be successful. So my biggest thing now is just to make sure that if people are doing raw, that they're supplementing. And, and most people don't, you know, as you know, Ryan, most people don't know about supplementation. You know, they don't get it or they'll do one thing, you know. Of course. And, um, you know, besides, I think, longevity, I don't think there's any really way to do it yourself, is there? I mean, it would be, be so costly. There's nobody else that does the 90 essential nutrients like us that creates right. a baseline like that. There is some holes and some gaps that could be filled. I've learned to fill them in in the business. And there's reasons why they can't all be in the baseline products. Just quick example. If you're low on zinc, I use what I call a zinc flush. It's a high dose of zinc. Your doctor might tell you it's a dangerous dose. I'm talking about 100 to 150 milligrams per day for an adult. If they're closer to 100 pounds, it'll be 100. If they're 150 pounds or more, it'll be 150. That's way over the RDA. And some mm. might say that's a toxic dose. This is a short term dose. I'm just mm. saying we wouldn't put 150 milligrams in a daily general multivitamin supplement. It, that would not be suitable for everybody. So there's certain gaps that you just can't cover in a in a baseline general program like that. Right. I want to step back a little bit. And then I want to give my opinion on what I would do for dogs now, my current opinion. I worked in the exotic pet industry. We we bred and sold snakes, geckos, arachnids, tarantulas, scorpions, centipedes, nice. other lizards, you know, it's just like this type of stuff. And the feeders that fed them, the rats and the mice and guinea pigs and rabbits and all, all that stuff. The rodents did absolutely fantastic on pelleted food and nothing else. Absolutely fantastic. No problems at all. Of course, this is not what most people are coming to us with. You know, dogs and cats are a little bit more complicated and they have much longer lifespans. So you have more time to see something go wrong. But in the exotic industry, we have done such incredible things. Unbelievable. 
I'm talking about double, triple, quadruple, every species that you can need. Double is the minimum. Like of what, you know, we grew up with these like wildlife fact file books from Reader's Digest or whatever. Whatever it said the animal lived in the wild, the minimum in the pet industry was double that. Yeah. And in many, many cases, it's triple, quadruple, or even more. And you're not going to find this by Googling it in Guinness World Records and stuff because it's, you know, it's a hobbyist industry. But we have plenty of people with 20-year-old geckos. We had some geckos up to 20 and they're, they're supposed to live seven years or five years in the wild and just unbelievable success. And the way that we did it, I'm not talking about me personally and our company and whatever, just the animal supplement business. If you go to the pet store, there's bird pellets, there's rat pellets, there's rabbit pellets. And if you have a, a reptile, there's snake powder, gecko powder, you know, what? uh, Argentinian tegu powder, whatever your species is, there's a powder for that. And so the way that we've achieved such massive success in longevity, reproductive health, and even, you know, some of these species that would say, oh, expect eight snakes to come out. You'd get 12, you'd get 16, you'd get 20. Crazy. Because a lot of people went overboard with the supplements because we realized how well it worked. So this is the secret. We'd use their natural food and we'd cover it in powder. Or we'd stuff the mouse, you know, dead, dead. You're supposed to feed them dead. You're not supposed to feed them live because it can bite your snake and cause a problem. Kill it. It could kill it in some cases. And nobody wants to buy a snake with a missing eye. These things <laughs> can happen. So you kill the mouse first and then you stuff the mouse full of pellets, vitamins, raw minerals. And if you didn't do that, you would start to see a problem quite quickly, right? Because snakes don't just eat mice. They do eat mice, but they also hang out in puddles. They drink from puddles. Honestly, I think that's like the biggest thing. Puddles leach in minerals from leaves and from the soil and whatever. There's a mineral rich concoction. That's what they drink from. They don't drink distilled water or tap water with fluoride in it, which competes for iodine in a snake, just like it does for a human. So we stuff the mice or we take the crickets or the cockroaches or the mealworms or whatever, and we'd shake them up in a bag full of this powder and it'd cover all the animals. And so they're just, instead of getting just a cricket, they're getting a supplemented cricket. And all of a sudden, our animals are living double, triple, quadruple, or even more. Like Again, I, incredible. And in terms of size as well, like uh, there's some reptile zoos and even just regular zoos, but like zoos that specialize in reptiles. Again, whatever it says in the textbook is the maximum length of this species. There's people out there that have double, triple, crazy, the size of it, like huge animals. And it's because of this, this big emphasis on supplementation in the industry. In fact, in the industry, it was called animal abuse. If you didn't supplement your animals, that's abuse. If you just feed your snakes mice, other people are going to get upset with you and call you out about it. And honestly, on the forums and stuff, this is before social media, we had forums, you know, and people would freak out at you for not supplementing your animals. They'd say you are cruel and unusual. What are you doing? And yeah. With any regular species, too, we're talking about simple things, ball pythons and uh, crested geckos and stuff, they would just stop eating after a while. If you just fed them the crickets or you just fed them the mice, you got six months, maybe two years before you, they're just going to stop eating. They're going to not be interested in eating because they need other nutrients to process that food. So they will just stop. They'll start wasting away. And in one generation, if you don't give them these supplements that are made for that species, which are not all that different, by the way. You look at the labels. They're not all that different. But if you don't do that, they're, your animals, they might not make it out of the egg. This was I had to learn this the hard way. You, know, you, you go through all this work to breed these animals. They don't make it out of the egg. The, you, you know, you're cracking open eggs and there's dead geckos inside. It's I cried, honestly. I was I was soft. I was a kid. I just had to learn this. Like, oh, oh okay, okay. We've got to give them the powders or they might not make it out of the egg. Their egg tooth might not develop. Their snakes might have crooked spines and not know how to eat and stuff. Like from birth, they just, they die. You know, they, they crawl around for a week and they die. So it's yeah. very quick when it shows up in reptiles. But the, the difference here is like, if you give them the supplements, you can double, triple, quadruple their lifespan. They can live these long, healthy lives. They can get huge, way bigger than you ever thought they could. And if you don't, then very, very quickly, you're going to see a problem. Usually within months in some of the shorter lived species, and uh, it might take a couple of years in the longer lived species, but you will see the problem. There's no escaping it. You will absolutely see the problem. 
So it was just very, very dramatic for me. I also saw this in the rodents as well. We had cages and cages full of rodents that we just gave them our pellets. And sometimes my mom would give them salads or whatever, but it was a very mm -hmm. minor, minor addition. I had a girlfriend at this time. She had a rabbit and a mouse, a fancy mouse. She gave it all kinds of home cooked food and stuff like that. And the rabbits, she wanted to breed them. We bred them. The rabbit had miscarriages and it ate the babies after. This is what rodents do. Dogs will do it too. They're smart. You know, these uh, stillborns, they're, they're just a, a nutrient source that they can recycle. Sorry for going long on this, but the fact was we knew exactly what went wrong. You weren't feeding them the pellets. You were giving them salads and carrots and all this other stuff you thought was better for them. And look what happened. They had miscarriages. Let's go in and switch this again. Same with her little fancy mouse. It was growing tumors that were like as big as the mouse itself. And she says, oh my gosh, okay, so we know this mouse is going to die. Let's breed it. Put her on pellets first. Throw in one of my random males. Give birth to this huge litter. Huge litter. All 100% healthy animals. You know, it's just, it's so quick that you can see it show up in these animals. You take them off the pellets. Very, very quickly, they start to fail. They won't breed properly. All this stuff. They'll birth defects, miscarriages, you name it. And they're, they're not going to live anywhere near their lifespan. So having said all of that, what I would do now with dogs, again, because we don't want them just to get 10 to 14 years like a wolf. Or it's same thing, 10, 12, 14 years with a coyote. Very, very similar animals. And we should talk about their scavenging habits and stuff. I think it's interesting. Take real food, raw food add the supplements, we should still see the same thing. They should now be living 20 years, 24 years, 28 years. And there's some contention here. But I was looking up the longest lived dog. And this one is commonly talked about this Portuguese dog named Bobby. And uh, he is said to live to 31. Guinness World Record just pulled that because they said they can't prove it. Mm. But so it now it's defaulted to the other one which died in 1939. His name was Bluey, an Australian cattle dog. And he lived in Australia. Yeah, Victoria, Australia, Southern Ontario, uh, Southern Australia. That dog lived to 29 years old. Either way, I bet both of these dogs had access to wood ashes. I bet they were fed bones. I bet they could drink from puddles. I bet they got plenty of fresh air, exercise, love. They had a relatively easy life, right? A wolf and a coyote has a hard life. They have to go in and forage. You mentioned fasting earlier. Yeah. Foraging fast. Yeah. <laughs> They're not going to catch a, a, a caribou every day. Right? right. This is what I think is the next biggest problem. Even that dog food that you held up earlier, it said beef on it, right? Grass fed beef. Okay. So. People think grass-fed beef, oh, well, it's grass-fed, it's organic, it's, you know, that's good, isn't it? Well, how often do you think a wolf is going to take down a cow? Exactly. Honestly. I was yeah. looking up the, uh, the diet of a wolf earlier, and I already knew this, but let's just confirm this, mm -hmm. that uh, over a half a century of research on wolves reveals that they also prey on smaller animals, such as beavers, hares, rabbits, marmots, rodents along with fish and even birds. And they scavenge too. They eat rotting meat carry-on. They eat garbage. I'm going to also throw in here eggs. And you said berries. Yeah, absolutely. When berries are in season, the bears also will ignore everything else. Bears are also fairly similar to us anatomically. Mm -hmm. They'll eat the heck out of those berries. Gain the weight for the winter. It's a, it's a very normal, natural thing. Dogs will do this too. You let your dog out in the forest, it'll start eating berries. It'll start whatever it can find. And it's smarter than you because it doesn't have to think about things. Mm -hmm. Our conscious brain gets in the way of things sometimes. Animals can sniff things out, travel massive, massive dif uh, distances to get nutrients. Don't mean to hog the mic too much, but there's even like elephants in Africa. I think it's Nairobi where they will go way into underground caves. Elephants in deep underground caves to get the minerals, right? There's just, the minerals are not spread evenly around the world and uh, the animals know where to find them. And no surprise, elephants are one of the longer lived species. So they have enough brain power to go and seek out 
nutrients and so do dogs that's why they'll that's why they'll lick the the fire pit and stuff like that they know what they're doing and if yeah. we allow them to do those things they'll live longer yeah. and there are those people that are doing like you know the barf diet and the whole prey diet which i've also done too but again you have to you have to supplement right um I've liked to do little small Cornish hens and given them to my dogs in the past. The reason I have this food is because, you know, I am um, in just two months, I have some new adopted dogs that my aunt passed away and, you know, I've taken them on. So I'm trying to get them off their little kibble diets <laughs> and they're really stubborn and really, you know, so I'm trying to wean them through to something that is, you know, that I feel will be, you know, more healthy for them long-term, you know? So yeah, you know, it's it's always a challenge sometimes when you have these um, dogs that are conditioned to eat a certain way. Sometimes it could take some not some of them are easy, but some of them are really stubborn. <laughs> you know, depending on the breed. So we're working toward we're working toward that. You mentioned before when we spoke on the phone yesterday that cats can be really hard to switch their diet. Yeah, cats are cats are hard. I mean, I find that I've had clients where it's literally taken like four months. And, you know, I've always tried to think outside the box to try to get them to, to do it. And I mean, the problem is too, and I don't know, like, I'm kind of, I'm not really sure how to take the whole, I mean, I, we know that cats, like if they get sick, um, they won't eat, right? Sometimes they'll start starving themselves. And then everyone's like worried about fatty liver disease in the cats. Um, it's one thing that the vets say, I feel like in the wild, the cat probably fasted, but I don't know why that's happening now and domesticated cats like, so, um, but yes, it could be hard. So I always, you know, there's, there's a, you know, there's a whole bunch of information out there. How to wean your cats off kibble to, you know, a little bit of meat and get them used to it, you know, cause they really are more smell, uh, you know, enticed by food smells, you know, and it can be hard. You know, I have had some cats that, you know, they were so sick and losing their hair. And then I said, just get some liver, get some liver, start feeding a little liver, a little bit, cut up chicken pieces. And then it devoured it and the hair grew back. I mean, you know, and just, just turn, turn its health around, um, by just adding that to what it was already doing, you know, but, um, the kibbles, I feel are really problematic for the cats as well, because they need more, they don't drink a lot of water. And, you know, what is the kibbles have like, what is it like 10% or six to 8% water? intake, you know, so it's hard on their kidneys, just so much. It's just, yeah, it's harder. It's harder with the cats, but you got to start them young. You know, once they start getting addicted to those carbohydrates, it's like kitty crack to them. So I think that's why it makes it a lot harder. And they're different than dogs. They're like, yeah, I'm not doing that. You know, <laughs> they're less people pleasing. Well, we so, see this with humans too. Yeah, we for see sure. Humans get addicted to carbs and breakfast cereals and other dehydrating foods, you know, where they're living years, decades in a chronic dehydration state, and it yeah. takes longer for a human to develop a chronic disease in most cases. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of miracles, to be honest. I mean, a young human is 20 years old, whereas that's a very old dog and a very old cat and a very old horse and all the all this stuff. So, you know, often chronic disease won't show up until they're beyond 20 years old in a human. But still, we can see the signs early on. And of course, childhood diabetes and all this stuff is is becoming a very, very real thing. It's 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 huge. And dehydration is a big part of that, actually. And there's something about being addicted to carbs and sugar that makes you not want to drink regular water, because a lot of these same people are drinking sugar water and coffee and energy drinks and just other things that keep them chronically dehydrated. And then, yeah, of course, by the time they get to adulthood, they're practically guaranteed to have some sort of chronic disease state. And some of these foods, Ryan's too, like a lot of even the canned foods that have really high carb content, you know, a lot of these, these cats and dogs are getting diabetes. My aunt's um, uh, dog just passed away on Sunday, pancreatitis and diabetes, and they were given the, given a treats like all the time, you know, like I try to help. I saw her maybe a couple of months ago and I was like, you know, your, your dogs, it's hard to say your dog's a little bit overweight. It's really hard on them. Like one or two pounds on a dog is like a lot, you know what I mean? People don't realize. And I think 50% of our dogs in the U S are overweight, you know, because we're giving them those treats. And I know I've heard Dr. Wallet talk about, if you're going to give a treat, give the ones that have the bone and joint is, is you still feel like that's probably the correct thing to do. I say that, that, Either just give them a bone, or if you are going to give them a treat, yeah, just buy the ones that are grain-free, first of all, and that have, like, 
bone and joint support on the label or antioxidant support on the label, because that means that it'll have extra nutrients in it. Because dogs love yeah. bones. They don't need to yeah. actually eat something. They love a bone. Just give them a bone. They'll it's chew on it. <laughs> not cooked. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to cook it. Just, just throw them a bone. They'll, they'll uh -huh. eat it. A lot of people worry about chicken bones. Honestly, I'm not going to say I'm that experienced with actually owning dogs. Truly, I have not had that many dogs. We're not even allowed to have pets. I have to leave yeah. the country every two months and I can't have a pet. But for, I know quite a few people who do give them chicken bones. They never knew that yeah. rule. Not a problem in general. I've done, I've done chicken feet before. One thing I will say though, to uh, you know, we've we some of these people they've, they've so domesticated their dogs. The dogs have learned how to chew. It's they just have to remember who they are because I know there's sometimes dogs will not know what to do with it or gulp it down. And I always just tell people to supervise. They're they're the natural thing will kick in. They'll learn how to do it. But I know that sometimes dogs have choked because it's like when they're first learning. So I always just tell people hold it, supervise it. You know. And then they'll be fine. That's, you know, that's what they're, they're, they're meant to do, chew on bones. So, so because I know there, there have been dogs that have choked. Just some like, dogs are dumber than others too. Don't <laughs> yeah, that's mean, true. But, okay, that's so. true. With all the breeding and the mixed crossbreeding that they're doing and puppy mills, it's really, yeah, it's really sad. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say too, is, you know, like, you asked me what I would do. Like, I'm that person that's going to go above and beyond and do, I mean, you know, like, cost is no limit to what I'm going to do feed wise and supplement. Now, if someone came to me who was on a budget, you know, it's hard for me because I, you know, there are some canned foods out there. There are some companies out there that are trying and they are doing better, right? Cause there's an information coming out about, you know, the truth about dog food, blah, blah, blah. But the other thing that I, that I am finding, which we, I said to you the other day is that like the sodium selenite, selenite or selenite is in some of these higher quality canned foods. And they also have oils. Mm -hmm. They're putting a lot of oils in these foods. And I'm just like, ah, oh, you know. In so one nutrient, they're not required. This surprised me. They're not required to put in omega-3. They're not? They're not. I didn't know that. I mean, I'm always giving mine, you know, a cap or two a day. But I didn't know that. Now that's important. That's huge. So I have not done an omega-3 deep dive episode yet. I plan to, but everybody should know omega-3 is only made by plants. So a lot of those plants are sea plants. This is the reason that seafood tends to be higher in omega-3 or very high in omega-3 is because, you know, the little fish eat the seaweed and then the bigger fish eat the, and it concentrates each level up the food chain. There's some land plants. There's some, not very many. There's some land plants that do actually produce omega-3 by themselves but no animal produces omega-3 so if the chickens were not fed omega-3 there's no omega-3 in the chicken same with the cows same with whatever animal it is right so grass fed might not mean anything you know, th there might be some omega-3 in some of those herbs they're munching on but it's not something you can guarantee at all and in general they're much higher doses in the sea so just kind of touching on what we said earlier uh, us humans have beaten other species we've beaten practically every other species um in part because we're smart and in in part in my opinion because most of us settled on the sea and most human populations still to this day live on the coasts and all okay almost all of the longest of populations are sea-based people they eat primarily seafood even the ones that live in the mountains such as in chile this is going back in time. This is not considered a, a blue zone today. But even some of these mountain populations made great journeys down to the coast to go and get fish eggs, to go and get seaweed, you know, to go and get other seafoods that would give them iodine and omega-3. They didn't know this. They were not chemists. But these are two huge nutrient deficiencies in today's society. And if humans are facing the same deficiencies, then animals are as well. You know, you, you just mentioned 50% of dogs roughly in America being overweight. Well, it's about the same number for humans, right? It's no wonder we have very similar eating habits, even though they actually get more supplementation in the, in the dog foods. So this hacking that we've done and finding some of these extra mineral sources and, and omega-3 sources and stuff, I think we should apply this to our dogs. I would imagine that most of these dogs actually are iodine deficient and omega-3 deficient. And you just said, yeah, they put oils in these dog foods and they superheat them, super cook them, cook them to 400 degrees and then take them out and then recook them. 
right? And, and Ryan, what really quick, not to interrupt, but what do you feel about, like, I look at some of the plants they're putting in some of these canned foods, and if they're like GMO, isn't that blocking, like, uh, B1? Couldn't that be blocking? The, the B1 the will be destroyed by the heating. Okay. Almost all the B vitamins will be destroyed by the heating. If they put them in after, I'm not sure. I'm not a formulation expert here, but right. if they put them in after the cooking, then sure, they'll, they'll be there, I guess. But if I don't know what they're doing before or after. That's a good question. I have seen a little documentary on it. We were talking about Gary, Vic, uh, Gary Richter, America's favorite veterinarian yesterday, and he had this little video. He went kind of viral with it. And I, I'm pretty sure they're adding all the stuff and then cooking it. Right. And and then recooking it. So if it's a kibble, I don't see how they could add it on after the kibble's not powdered with vitamins. It's in the formula. So if they if they super cook it, th there's no B1 in it. That B1's been destroyed as um, many, right. many of the B vitamins as well. And this right. is how you can see congestive heart failure on dogs. This is a quite common problem, to be honest. I just went through that. And let me tell you, it's awful. It's one thing I would never wish on anyone to go through with their pet. It's awful. Because their whole body will start shutting down before the heart does. Yeah, it's 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 horrible, horrible to watch. And, you know, even for me having to supplement and putting her on um, on a protocol, you know, she was, you know, I only had her three, three years or, you know, I adopted her from somebody else. But, um, you know, when they're on that Lasix, it's like it's catch 22 because when they're filling up and you're trying to drain the lungs and then, you know, it's affecting, you know, the nutrients and all that stuff. It's just, you know, it's just it's just hard, really hard. So labels are deceptive. If you put nutrients in and you heat them, you're killing a lot of those nutrients. Even some of the minerals become unavailable at those high temperatures. Yeah. And you mentioned selenite yesterday, and I I didn't know this. It's been a while. You know, my mom's dogs, they died years ago. I haven't had a dog in a long, long time. So I didn't know they were putting sodium selenite in it. You wouldn't do that with a human supplement that's no it's toxic. Scary. And almost every food that i like if i found a food that i was like okay if someone because someone's like what can i do i'm not going to do that i'm trying to find something to tell them to eat and I'm, it's it's always a compromise okay well there's that and that it's at the bottom or there's some oil in that or or there's or there's food but there's no supplementation it's just it's so difficult you know if anyone out there knows of a food that you know actually is decent you know i um I struggle to find something that that has that doesn't have something wrong with it. You know what I mean? We always have to make compromises to make something have shelf life. And that's kind of a big problem. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I could not find one with, uh, without selenite when I was doing a little bit of looking around. And we do have uh, animal supplements, by the way. And you asked me yesterday, do they have everything? And... I don't think so, but I'm, I'm I would at... the perpetual plus an EFA, you know, <laughs> I've given my pets pretty much everything I think, but just as like a staple standard, you know, EFA, Arthrodex perpetual, you know, EFA perpetual, that's it, you know. So both of these are products that we sell, by the way, they're longevity products. I like both of them. Uh, the Perpetual Plus just kind of came out recently, right? Yeah. And these are not available in Canada, by the way, so I'm I'm not really familiar with them. Um, let me say, when I have been given dogs to try and help in Canada or been asked advice about, but I did actually have somebody kind of gave me their dog to help it. He still ended up putting the dog down later, but not because it was sick, actually. It was getting a lot better. He just he couldn't have it at his house since it was an older dog. Um, I switch the dog food to gluten-free dog food because gluten still yeah. messes up the intestines of them just like okay. it does for us yeah i gave it raw minerals because that's all i had gave it raw minerals our plant drive mineral complex it was actually the fertilizer version just, oh, okay you know, I, i'm okay. cheap and this is not even my dog and i just you know, i don't want to help this dog Give it the fertilizer, which is just raw plant-derived mineral complex. It's actually after they've leached out the humic shale to make our human supplements. It's what's left over. It's just this kind of powdery little pellet, kind of like coffee grounds, but you can just break it up in your hands. 
it works quite well. Dogs like it. You can even taste it yourself. It tastes uh, kind of sour, kind of like Pop Rocks. I don't know if you remember Pop Rocks, little candy yeah. powder stuff. Uh, uh, anyways, I would add raw eggs as well with okay. the shell. You know, it just I kind of winged it. I had to come up with a kind of a program for animals that I could do, especially in countries that don't get those pet products. So raw minerals, eggs. If it was a tiny dog, you could do one egg, two egg. This case, it was a medium sized dog. And I think it was giving him her two, two to four a day at first. And I think I kind of settled down on two with the shells, just mix them in. Most dogs will go for it. We talked yeah. earlier about cats. Cats usually won't go for it. You might have to trick them a little bit, wean them into it. Cats are stubborn. Dogs usually are not stubborn. They'll usually eat whatever you give them. So they'll gobble up the eggshells as well. I'm not, I'm not assuming they're absorbing very much of those eggshells. I just thought it was a good idea. And the uh, frequency tuning disc. On the collar, ah. on the collar, the secret weapon, because EMF affects animals just like it affects us. And I think that's one of the major reasons why we're seeing so many health problems in these animals, not just that the dog foods have gotten worse because they haven't gotten exponentially worse to my knowledge. They've probably been using selenite a long time. They probably haven't been using omegas for a long time. They've probably been superheating for decades and decades and decades. And yet it's just now that we're seeing this explosion of health problems in animals and in humans. Obviously, we're busy in the health business for a reason. It's a co combination of these problems of processed foods, nutrient deficiencies, and EMF. Five years ago in this business, it was not common for every single person in the world to have Wi-Fi. Not everyone had Wi-Fi. Your grandma didn't have Wi-Fi probably until three years ago, maybe six years ago. This is now a problem that our, our pets are exposed to as well. We're supposed to be grounded to the earth and get the negative ions from the earth flow up through our body, drain out some of the free radicals in our body. I know that's kind of complicated. You can read the book Earthing by Clinton Ober. It's my favorite grounding book currently. But it's the same true for dogs and true for cats. I mean, they're connected to the earth. They're supposed to be. Now we brought them inside. We have poorer air quality inside. We have tons of chemicals inside the carpets, the couches, the clothing, the blanket that they sit on, the, the little pet bed that you buy them at the pet store. Smell it when you first get it. It smells like chemicals, right? All this stuff adds up to a toxic environment. And then you add an EMF, EMF on top of that. And every single home now not only has Wi-Fi, every member of the home has a cell phone. We have invited in all these other devices Air purifiers with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on them. Microwave with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on it. What the heck is going on? Toasters. All these things. And I actually did an episode somewhat recently with uh, Mike from Safeguard Solutions. It's a company that goes into people's homes and identifies the sources of EMF. And he said that the biggest sources, the most problematic sources, it's not the big appliances. It's not your furnace or your water heater or your fridge or your, or your stove even. It's all the little things that we brought into our homes willingly, all of them that are giving out wireless signals. All of those signals are going through our bodies. They're going through our pets' bodies. They're impacting the water cells in the pets. Then this is like your blood cells. This is, what, this is the fundamental problem with EMF to me. I don't care about the intricate details. It affects our water. We're mostly water. Our blood cells are mostly water. Our blood cells are what transport around oxygen, they would take waste out of the cells, and get rid of them. They transport nutrients, right? That all these signaling molecules, all this stuff is based in water. So we know from live blood analysis, we can prove it immediately when exposed to EMF. Our blood, our pet's blood, the red blood cells clump up and stick together. And instead of being nice, round, you know, sort of cylindrical things, like, you know, tubes on the lazy river, right? You sit on the little inner tube and you float down the lazy river. That's what the blood cells are supposed to be like. But when they're clumped up and stuck together and crumpled up like pieces of paper that you're about to throw in the trash, they cannot transport oxygen properly. They cannot effectively attack pathogens and problems in the blood. They can't do they can't do their job properly. So we have had a harder heart and harder time helping humans in this business over the years. Products are getting better. People are making smarter food choices. Americans exercise more than anyone else in the world. There's more gym memberships sold in America than anywhere else in the world. We're trying, and yet it's harder and harder and harder to help people. 
because we're continuing to crank up the EMF in our homes, outside of our homes. We continue, not me, but many people continue to pay their phone bills and allow these cell phone towers to get put up everywhere. You know, they buy a house beside a uh, electrical substation, transfer station, because it's cheaper. You know, oh, I got a great deal on this house. Well, you got a cell phone tower, you know, 200 feet away and then a high voltage line running down the street right beside the house. So just all this stuff has added up to a very toxic environment for all of us. And I actually think that that is the biggest problem for all of us because we can make smarter food choices. There's plenty of organic options out there now. This whole organic food, you know, good food growing movement that's out there. There's lots of farmers doing that. Supplements are available. We've got the best supplements that have ever existed in the history of the world. And the supplement science has been practically perfected. You were very good at it. We've got very smart formulas. And yet, it's harder and harder and harder to help people and animals. EMF is the factor that has changed the most. I agree. All right. And while we're on the subject of radiation and EMF, I should tell you my story with hydrogen water here. You've been hearing me talk about hydrogen water here on the podcast. I have partnered with the Zontos Water Company which I do believe they have the best machines on the market in terms of PPM, how much hydrogen is in the water, half-life, how long it stays in the water, and long-term performance of the machine. That's a very important factor. There's a lot of machines out there that we've tested that do not perform over the long term. So it might be sold to you telling you it has three, 3.5 PPM, and yet after a week or two or four, it's got zero. 0.1. That's not good enough. So I'd been hearing about hydrogen water for a while, but I hadn't really looked into it. And then honestly, I happened to meet the owner of the Zantos Water Company, and he was very firm. No, nope, we have the best machines. That's what he was telling me over and over. Asked him to prove it. He showed me what he had. And I did a lot of research out there looking for a machine that would outperform the Zantos models. And since hydrogen water has become popular recently, I've been pitched on other companies as well. And after digging through the specs, I'm still very happy with the Zontos water machine. So other than meeting the owner of Zontos, I was really looking to partner with a water company, first of all, just whatever the best water is, I want to know and I want to sell it as well, because people ask me all the time. But more importantly, my actual problem in life, the health problem that I could not figure out, was how hard of a time I had spending half my time here in the outskirts of Houston. When I live at my country house the other half of the time, way up north in Canada, I'm fine. I sleep fine. My energy's fine. I really don't have any complaints. But I would come here and I couldn't sleep properly. Same with my mom's house. My mom lived in the suburbs for many years. She just moved. But I couldn't sleep at her house. It would drive me nuts. Even when I did actually get to sleep, I would never wake up feeling actually rested. And I have all kinds of anti-EMF devices, by the way. I've collected many of them over the years. I sell several of them. I just mentioned frequency tuning discs earlier. I know they work. They have helped me tremendously. We can show the benefit that they have to many people. People have sent me all kinds of other devices as well. And still, I could not sleep properly in the city or the suburbs. And I was an insomniac for many years, by the way. For 25 years, I was an insomniac. But the minerals, the 90 essential nutrients, especially the bone minerals, that fixed it. I was no longer an insomniac. It was amazing. But then when I would go back to a city and try and stay in a city in a hotel or a friend's house, I couldn't sleep. And that catches up with you real quick. So I'm getting groggy and grumpy and miserable because I can't sleep. I'm getting weird neuropathy pains, weird sciatic pains, stuff I'd never even experienced before. Just because I was spending so much time here in Houston. And I mentioned that book, Grounding by Clinton Ober. I bought a grounding mat after I read that book. We put it on the bed. It did help. It did help. It helped a lot, especially because it didn't cost very much. So I got a lot of bang for that buck, but it wasn't perfect. I still couldn't sleep 100% through the night. I still did not wake up feeling 100% rested. And my nutrition is on point. I take tons of supplements. We don't eat junk food or anything like that. Even at my country house, I'll snack a bit more. You know, I'll make cookies and stuff more often. Here, my wife doesn't really let me have sugar to be honest so my diet is actually better here in the city and yet still i was so miserable from not sleeping but the zontos machine basically fixed the problem overnight i now sleep completely through the night it's basically 100 i don't have any complaints i feel rested 
I have a lot more energy through the day as well. There are several of the essential nutrients that are said to help with EMF somewhat. I'm sure they do help somewhat, but I must be overly sensitive or something because even with the best nutrition I could get, it still did not work to make me sleep 100%. I was becoming dependent on melatonin and stuff. It's just not good. And you can pop in hydrogen water into Google. You'll get a lot of interesting things. There's thousands of studies out there showing all kinds of different benefits. I've got a document here that another company sent me. They're pitching me on their hydrogen machine. So they compiled a bunch of studies here on a whole bunch of different stuff just to give you an idea of how many different things hydrogen water has been shown to benefit. Immune system health, COVID, hormone health, healthy inflammatory response and acting as an antioxidant because hydrogen itself is basically an antioxidant. It bonds with the hydroxyl radical, which is an OH molecule. So that's said to be one of the most reactive of the reactive oxygen species. A lot of the health nerds out there will know what I'm talking about. ROS. These are free radicals. There's many different species of free radicals, they say. Reactive oxygen species. So the OH molecule is basically one of the most, if not the most, reactive of the reactive species. So hydrogen goes and bonds with that OH. And now what do you have? You have H2O, water. Right? So it turns a free radical into water. That's how it acts as an antioxidant. Very, very interesting. Here in the same document, we've got asthma and allergic inflammation, COPD, gut health and digestive enzyme production, very important, cardiovascular health and disease treatment, heart protection, liver health enhancement, hearing loss, eye protection, allergies, skin health, diabetes, Literally almost any health problem or health system, body system that you can name, there's studies out there showing that hydrogen water has an effect on that. Weight management, that's one of the big testimonials I keep seeing about it. Weight loss without actually changing anything else, which is pretty interesting. Cancer, that's a big research section on hydrogen water. Lots of people are showing its benefits to cancer and people who have done chemotherapy, making the chemotherapy work better with less side effects, all that stuff. Hypertension, athletic and muscle performance, anti-inflammatory properties, mood disorders, antioxidant and brain protection. It's a long list. So I just popped into Google hydrogen water EMF. See what comes up. First two things, two studies come up showing that Numerous studies have shown that electromagnetic pulse, EMP, radiation, may have seriously damaging effects on reproductive health. And molecular hydrogen, a selective hydroxyl radical scavenger, explains the protective effects against many diseases closely associated with oxidative damage, such as ionizing radiation. So, they're saying we recognize that EMF or EMP has seriously damaging effects on reproductive health. That's what this study was about. They subjected these rats to EMP to deliberately sabotage their reproductive system. And this study found that molecular hydrogen can reduce the damage of EMP exposure to the reproductive system of male rats. And I'm sure there's more studies. I just pulled up two. The second one here is pointing out that it is well known that most of the ionizing radiation induced damage is caused by hydroxyl radicals, the OH negative. And molecular hydrogen has antioxidant activities by selectively reducing OH. And another one, peroxynitrate, ONOO negative. I didn't even know about that one. And this study firstly hypothesized and demonstrated the radioprotective effects of the hydrogen water in vitro and in vivo. And this was repeated on different experimental animal models by different departments. And this one was randomized placebo controlled as well which showed that hydrogen-rich water reduces the biological reaction to radiation-induced oxidative stress without compromising anti-tumor effects. These studies can get pretty complicated, but what it shows is that hydrogen water has widespread benefits, and for me, the main thing was EMF. I needed to figure out how to sleep here in the city suburbs. It was driving me nuts, it was bogging me down, I was getting more gray hairs than ever, I needed to stop the problem, and hydrogen water stopped it for me. Now, I'm not saying that you should necessarily buy a hydrogen water machine for your pets, but if you make the investment for yourself and your family, everybody in the house can use it, and so can your pets. My wife's been giving it to the cats. 
I don't necessarily want her cats to live longer, but nonetheless, we can all use it and we can all benefit from the same machine because this is a machine that will perform long term. They've got machines over 14 years that are still performing at the same specs that they were when they were first produced, which is extremely impressive in this category of machine. This company is very passionate about making sure that they do have the best machines on the market and that they maintain that. So I know it's a relatively large investment. We're talking about $4,250 for the version with the water bottle on top that you can refill and you can also kind of travel with that as well. That's the benefit of this machine. This is the one that I actually have. This is the second most expensive thing I've ever purchased other than my house. Big investment for me. And the next model is about $4,500, which is inline, meaning you just connect it to your water filter, basically. And you don't have to fill up the water bottle every time. That's much more appropriate for a permanent location for this machine. I do want to be able to take mine with me if we go on the road. Just saying, I understand this is a large investment, but if you're thinking about what could bring you to the next level in life, you know, a lot of us are already supplementing and eating clean and exercising, and getting fresh air. Well, wh what's next? What can protect us even more from all the toxicity in our environment? Because hydroxyl radicals, by the way, they come from a bunch of different sources, not just EMF. And to me, the answer has been to step it up with the Santos machine. At the very least, I recommend that you look into it more. Lots of people are currently talking about hydrogen water and selling other machines and recommending the capsules, which I don't recommend, by the way, because they're made of magnesium. You can only take so much magnesium before you get diarrhea. Now that's causing you to lose more nutrients. So in an emergency, you could use the hydrogen water capsules, dissolvable capsules, or you could use one of the portable machines, which are sold for much cheaper. There's a reason they're sold for much cheaper, guys. It's because they don't perform long term. Just the facts. If you can find another machine that outperforms Zontos, send it to me. I'm interested because we are not aware of any. And by the way, I know that price tag sounds kind of heavy. I've been pitched on several machines now that cost a lot more than this and that do not even have as good of specs. They don't have as much PPM. They won't even tell you what the half-life is. And they can't show me any models over 10 years old that are still producing that output. Look into it more. Go to zontoswater.com slash not us, lowercase. That's in the description as well. And of course, you can share it with your pets too. Now we can get back to the episode. They also sell grounding mats for pets too, by the way. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a thing. Okay. They know that. Got to look into that. And, you know, we let pets go upstairs and stuff too. There was no upstairs for a dog ever until <laughs> like a few a few decades ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's also talk about all the medications and the, the vaccines that they're doing. Can I say that? Oh, sorry. Can I say that word? <laughs> I, I think I think so. It's it's, it's, it's over, OK if, if it's YouTube demonetizes me. us. It's well, whatever. Here, here's my issue. My issue is, OK, we know that legally, at least in the US, I don't know about Canada, you're supposed to get your rabies every three years. But I see so many people that are putting their animals in these dog care centers and they're making them do everything every year, which isn't, isn't, you know, something you have to do legally and, and people just do it. And, you know, even like the, the oral flea meds, it's a huge problem. Um, this, these little dogs were on that every month for their whole lives. I mean, he's only two, but the other one's 12, 13. And I just, yeah, it's just, it's a lot of poisons with everything else bombarding in their systems, you know? And rabies, if you didn't know, was never a real problem. Whether you're on terrain theory or not, it really doesn't matter right. whether you believe right. in virus transmission or not. Rabies was never an actual problem. The so-called cases of rabies were so rare, so far and few between, that the average dog has literally a 0% chance of, yeah. quote, contracting yeah. rabies and it's debatable whether rabies actually exists as a thing but right. even Look, if it did almost no one has any risk of ever catching it yeah 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 it, the, the the uh what's it called uh, i called i had there was a dog that i was trying to rescue and i was trying to get it boarded somewhere and i had called the one of the vcas and i was like can i get this dog boarded like oh no and they gave me a list of the vaccines that they wanted and i my mouth was on the floor i'm just like well, do they do this all at once i mean it was insane you know can they add the influenza one to it there's a couple new ones i was just like okay no thanks i won't uh, you know won't do that to this poor dog <laughs> so 
Unfortunately, veterinarians are paid under the same model as human doctors. So if there's no health problems with dogs, they have no job, you know, yeah. whereas the farm town veterinarian would be paid to keep flocks healthy and they'd be paid on more, more or less of a salary basis in the past. And, you know, you might, they might just come by and check out the farm every, you know, once a month. once every six months or once a year or something like that they just you, you probably wouldn't need them they're on standby they're on call you know like dr wallach if there's a yep. nitrates in the water or something they might come in and investigate but they're able to keep their job without having to deal with sick animals so they definitely it, they definitely use the oh come in and get your new vaccine or your health check to you know keep the money coming it keeps yeah. them relevant Right. And it definitely, I mean, just from like 20 years ago, when I started with a nonprofit and I was, you know, rescuing all the animals, like, you know, I'd been to all the vets in LA. I, I knew which ones to go for what and, you know, and it's just, it's gotten crazy. I mean, it's out of control now, what they're charging, what they're doing, over testing, so, so many things unnecessary. It's, you know, I know there's a lot of well-meaning vets out there, but it's just gotten really bad, you know, in my opinion. And that phrase that Dr. Wallach used, you know, treat them like dogs and they get better. He's talking about his human patients. Yes. Well, Wallach came up in the 40s and 50s and 60s and things have changed. You know, yes. doctors or veterinarians at one point were taught how to prevent diseases with nutrition, how to treat them with nutrition if there was a problem. But in general, they wouldn't be needed that much because the nutritional foundation was just there from the beginning, you know. educate the farmers on what to do. Even the, even the American government stepped in and did this. And uh, selenium's one example. We we're just talking about selenite. The American government came in at one point, I think it was in the 60s. I might have to correct myself on the screen here or in editing. Uh, they told farmers to put selenium into their soils, especially up in, um, up in the Northwest, especially when they started using sulfur-based uh, certain fertilizers, certain... pesticides that had sulfur in them which competes for selenium and there's already major swaths of america and other countries like new zealand that are very 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 depleted in selenium I'm talking about the great lakes region and the entire east coast especially for america wow. very very devoid in selenium but then they brought in some of these sulfur chemicals for farming and it, it actually inhibited the absorption of the selenium into plants and so we ha had huge problems this is economic problems here whole flocks were not doing very well. And so the government had to come in and tell farmers to add selenium to their feeds. And this is the same basic reason they added iodine into human foods in the 1920s, because we realized this was a society-wide problem. And these same problems tend to affect our animals as well. So I'm just saying that it, it was all about prevention before in, in the veterinarian industry. And now vets are being taught basically the same as human doctors. They will use absolutely the same drugs for arthritis and diabetes and cancer that they would use for a human. And they have absolutely no idea how to prevent or reverse it. And they do not understand the problems with dog foods and cat foods. Some of them kind of do, but it's it's a lot of weird ideas that they have. Like you mentioned, you go to your vet, you say, hey, I'm feeding my dog old Roy. They say, okay, put him on the science diet. And, and they think that that's the solution. Whereas, you know, I was looking at the... label of the science diet earlier and i'm like this is not very good they got barley wheat mm -hmm. you know what what is this iodized salts like uh, this these are some it's ingredients. the ones at the market are even worse the ones that they just sell at a regular market Woo! and they they make them look all delightful with their you know marketing a happy dog on the cover right yeah happy, healthy pets. And they show all these pictures of all these whole foods. And then you look and you're like, what? So, you know, yeah, everyone go look at your dog food, see if it's oils, there's gluten, wheat, sodium, selenite. Those are things you don't want. <laughs> so I hate to make it confusing for people. And I didn't even give my answer yet of what I would do if I had a dog or a cat for that matter. Yeah. First of all, I won't get one of these pets unless okay, a dog I wouldn't get a dog unless it's allowed to live outside that's just my personal preference we live in the deep country I spend half my time in two places but up up north in Canada where we live there's a lot of outdoor dogs out there you know they're usually big mountain dogs and stuff like that they can live outside year-round they love it you know yeah. they go and they, they eat 
whatever squirrels and mice and i mean you give them dog food too they but they can drink from the stream from the well and they just have a good life outside i don't yeah. want to walk a dog especially in the it, it, up there in canada it gets extremely cold Tamara, you've probably never felt that type of cold it's, I can't go under 17 degrees. That's the coldest I've ever been. And I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, no, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're talking minus 30, minus 40, oh, no. you know, Fahrenheit or Celsius, you know, whatever you're wow. yeah, yeah. So you, you spit in the air and it freezes in the air. You know, it, I don't want to walk the dog in that. So unless it can live outside totally, I'm just, I'm not interested in doing that. Yeah. And uh, I have to travel so much. We're not allowed to have pets right now. You the wouldn't want could. one of these then. <laughs> you I would, no, you'd have to I put mean, little boots on it. has got a lot of it. hair. <laughs> yeah, no, no, a lot of the dogs, you have to put boots on them out there or their, their paws will freeze. <laughs> a hawk but, will pick this this guy up. He's like not even five pounds. He's all hair, all we, hair. We actually had a cat living, in, on our, living at our house outside this year. Yeah. And I didn't feed the cat or anything, but I, I, I said hello to the cat sometimes. Yeah. And it just lived in a little tent we got there and it, it was fine, I guess. I don't know how it was surviving. Anyways, if it can live outside, I'm I'm happy with that. Air yeah. quality inside is actually kind of a big problem. If you do have pets inside, like when we were in the pet industry, we had to have at least two air purifiers running all the time. We, yeah. we've, we've messed up by living in places that don't have very much ventilation. And we have, this is a whole nother like, rabbit hole here, but AC, air conditioning and central heating, both of these pump out positive ions which are bad for us even though they're named positive this affects animals too animals have the same basic respiratory tract that we do they're affected by the poor air quality in most of our homes because they're poorly ventilated we got dust and, and and actually the pet stuff pet hair and dander and all that stuff contributes to the poor air quality in lots of our homes we need more ventilation and, and these central ac and, and heating is not good there's ways around that. That's another episode. We've actually done an ion episode and I will do another one. Just saying, I wouldn't personally get a dog unless it could live outside. But if, I, if it was living outside, then I would be trying to feed it whole smaller animals yes. as often as possible. And I know how to breed rats and rabbits and all that stuff. I would do that for the dog yeah, because they can eat the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Right. The, la the last dog we had, it was Chef Norman's dog, actually. Wonderful dog. The best dog ever. Smart dog. The native said he had the grandfather spirit. That Aww. dog. His name was Buddy. He got hit by a car, unfortunately. It was very, very oh, sad. Gosh. But uh, he would always be in the woods with us. And he would always just catch the little birds and stuff. And most of the time, he would just eat the liver and leave the rest of it. Yeah. Just straight eat the liver and eat the rest of it. If he felt like eating the rest of it, he would eat the rest of it. But yeah. uh, the whole animal is the only way the nutrients is completely balanced. Agreed. Yeah. It's that's the best for, way. That's for any carnivore animal. You can't just eat muscle. Right. So when we see grass fed beef on the label, that means muscle. It really does. And there's a lot of people who think, oh, they put all this junk in, in pet foods like um, ch uh, chicken byproducts or what was I looking at here? Meal. They have chicken meal. And byproducts. Is... Well, I think those byproducts are like part. Of, that's the best ingredients in here, actually. You think? I do. Then, there, then there's the real meat, and the real meat, really, what that means uh, now. I, it's been a while. Is three? It's only three percent actual meat. There's actually there's some websites that that share about what it, what the labeling really means. It's tr it's very tricky. You know, it not is. that I everyone to go down. It's just, you know, I know a lot of times people go look at the first three ingredients, make sure it's, it's, it's meat. You know, it's just, it's hard. I mean, I personally don't trust the foods out there. I'd much rather go buy a whole Cornish hen, give it to my dogs. Even if I have to kind of chop it, if the small dogs chop it up or wild rabbit, but again, it can be really expensive for people, especially have multiple dogs. So, you know, there's always compromises. It's like, we're trying to do the best we can within this imperfect world. That's always the challenge, you know? And I just I encourage people the time to do best you can with what you have, you know, available to you, because it's going to be better than going to the market and just trusting these really poor quality kibbles, you know, and supplement. And I think honestly, the simplest thing to do, this is what Gary Richter recommends. Feed him the regular food, find a decent dog food, add supplements, add yeah. supplements. I know tons of people in the supplement business that just give their dogs the same human supplements that we do. I would still say canned over kibble, though, if you're going to do it canned. I agree. Yeah. 
easier to mix in the supplements too. Yeah. Easier yeah. to stir in the supplements there. And it's the same for us. No matter what we're eating, if we're eating whole, healthy, organic food, it still doesn't have enough nutrients in it. So, And there, there's also people that do like a slow cooking or crock pot, you know, and, you know, a lot of times people, they're not putting in like, you know, any bone, like b- eggshells or something. But yeah, if you're going to do that, you have to supplement because it's still not going to be, it's not going to be okay. You know, we, but- we do have our pet products, but, and I know a lot of people that use these, you know, the, these one of the things I love in the the Arthrodex, for example, it's got the enzymes in it. Mm-hmm. I go on and on and on about enzymes. Yep. Anything that's heated to 400 degrees has absolutely no enzymes in it. We need enzymes to do work in the body. This is sixth grade science class. We all forgot it. Enzymes are proteins that do work in the body. Mm-hmm. Almost all of the work in the body are done by an enzyme. Almost every disease that you can name, go look up the medical literature. What are they talking about? Enzymes. This enzyme has failed. This enzyme got in the way. It's enzymes that do the work. We take vitamins and minerals because they're cofactors for enzymes. But if we take vitamins and minerals and we don't have enzymes, it's not going to work. right? If you give dogs dog food with vitamins and minerals in it, assuming they haven't been killed by the heat, it's not going to work without enzymes. So this Arthrodex is basically an enzyme supplement. It's and also- the dog seemed to be okay with it. Like this one, I can't get him to, if I put it in the food, he will not eat it. I mean, I'm, I'm working my way, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I did finally get him to take the, uh, perpetual plus, but you know what I had to do? I had to stick it in some beef tallow so that he would eat it. <laughs> okay. It's a job <laughs> trying per- to get it in him, you know? So both of these supplements and they come in a pet pack, by the way, mm-hmm. I mean, they, they have the, they both have liver in it. And uh, it's got the humic minerals in there, humic acid, acid mineral blend. So that's the same stuff that we the take. Herbs, it's got the, the milk, herbs. Right? We could talk uh, about that. Ginkgo. It's got glucosamine. That's uh, one of the important things for joint health. And, uh, and 70 yeah. of the dried flat, min- flat minerals in that one too, right? Yeah. Yep. 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 And like I said, these are kind of new to me because I, well, they're not new. I just, I don't get to use them in Canada. So I usually just give them plain minerals, but the enzyme thing is, is huge. Humans need more enzymes too. This is a a huge problem in our food system that a lot of us are just eating almost all cooked food, almost all the time. And enzymes are destroyed at very low temperatures. We're not talking 400. We're talking like 170 Fahrenheit here. All your enzymes are dead. Basically microwave, all your enzymes are dead. Any high heat, long, long heating in an oven. I love using the oven, but it kills the enzymes. So I do love things like apple cider vinegar and raw honey. And, and you know, I've been eating raw garlic and raw onion, believe it or not. Wow. Just as an extra source. Oh, it took a while to get used to that. <laughs> Just as an extra source of enzymes, because I'm realizing how important they are, how yeah. amazing of results I've gotten in the last two, three years focusing on enzymes for our customers it's blown my results out of the water because I wasn't understanding, you know, you can't just give them the 90 essential nutrients. Those nutrients need enzymes to work and vice versa. And so, especially when people are like transitioning their dog from like a one food to another, I always really encourage my clients to get on some enzymes while they're doing that for their pets. They're like, Oh, it just helps. Cause sometimes the dogs will get, you know, the runs and, you know, it helps in those situations as well. You ever give them apple cider vinegar or honey or anything like that? Um, not so much honey, but I've done apple cider vinegar. Yeah. They lap it up. I haven't tried it with these dogs in the past. I just like sometimes I'll just put it like when I used to do their food, I would just kind of put in and mix it. Yeah, and it's fine. It depends. Every dog's a little different, you know. Well, Certain, a little more y- picky. Yesterday on the phone, you said something that was interesting. Hmm. You said you were detoxing dogs, and I said, "Wait, what?" What are you talking about? What do you mean? Okay. So I think what I meant is it's kind of like what I was doing with my story, right? I was, you know, a personal trainer when I really got sick. I was eating high protein diet. I got sick. I thought it was my diet. I went into, you know, vegan, raw, and I started healing because I was eliminating maybe, maybe, you know, maybe it was the cooked oils I was having or some of the, you know, the, the gluten, I was still on gluten at the time, you know, not all the time. Cause I was eating, I thought I was eating pretty lean. So I bought into the whole, well, I mean, first of all, I went vegan for ethical reasons. Anyway, it wasn't really health to begin with. Cause when I was dealing with animals, I just didn't want to eat them, but I started healing. Like I was able to heal myself of my Epstein-Barr, my fibromyalgia, 
Um, you know, but then, you know, long-term it just, it wasn't sustainable. And I kept detoxing. So when I was detoxing the pets, it was basically like, I would take these dogs that are on these commercial kibble diets, these really bad foods. And I would implement a program. Like I had a 14 day, um, like I called it like a pre detox, like a canine soup where I was just trying to get them familiar with like some cooked meats and some vegetables and like a broth to get them off those foods, you know? And then I would incorporate like, a you know, uh, herbs to detoxify and um, help with their, you know, certain glands and tissues. And so I saw a lot of these animals do really well and start healing. Right. And so there's a, I feel like there's a place for detox. There's a place for it. Um, you know, however, long-term, and I feel like this happened to my pets because I, you know, I've been doing the raw for at least seven, eight years um, for myself being a vegan high raw seven, eight years. Um I started, my hail started failing again. So that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I like to bridge, like, I think there's a, perp, there's a, there's a, there's still a need for it, but it's, it doesn't need to be so extreme. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like doing a cleanse or doing a, a, a short fast is fine. It's just that like, for me, I was doing fast every year. I think I had my longest was like a, I think it was a 33 or 43 grape juice fast. And then I did, you know, orange fast and like my whole thinking was, oh, I'm not alkalized enough. I need to, I need to keep detoxing. And I think I would be dead. Honestly, if it wasn't for this information, I would not be sitting in front of you right now, Ryan, having this conversation because I was on death's door. I really firmly, truly believe it. My B12 is like 73. I was anemic. Uh, you know, I gained like 60 pounds. My hair fell out. You know, I didn't do well when I got, you know, the, the virus this, you know, a few years ago. Um, so, you know, when I talk about DTEX, I, I feel like, you know, and I did like the colonics and all that stuff, which I feel like, you know, if someone's impacted, if they're coming from a standard American diet, sometimes those things will help. But then they, I feel like now with the information I know, I don't know that I would detox someone if they were deficient. So I would make sure someone was got, ha, was getting everything they needed and then if, you know, dep I mean, depending on why they're doing it, you know, I, I really have kind of changed my perspective about it now, you know, and it's it's in my back pocket if I need it, you know, especially with a sea monster kind of thing. Um, I know with, with dogs, sometimes I've put them on higher fruit diets and it has reversed that. I've seen it happen. And then there's a time, and then you balance out. So it's just something that, um, it seemed to have its place, but again, we get extreme and we don't know when to let it go. Like everyone's just in this detox lifestyle. So when I say with dogs, it's not like I put them on like fast, but every case was different, you know, like it, again, it could be, um, a dog might be eating, you know, raw four days a week and two days that were, were or one was a fast or one with some fruits, you know what I mean? And then it would repeat. And they seem to do better because they were having less excess of the fat that's overly abundant in some of these foods or whatever it is, you know, um, but long term, you know, I just from from experiencing it, you know, my my dogs also started having issues. So, yeah, it, you know, it's it didn't prolong their life. That's for sure. So I go in order with humans and I'm thinking this might be a good order for dogs as well. Digest is number one. Yes. Most people, I start, almost everyone is started on a digestion protocol and I train other coaches to do that as well. But most of the time, even then, I don't start them on actual supplements, like not nutrients, not vitamins, not minerals, not any of our, we have some complicated formulas and uh, complicated is good to me. They're sophisticated formulas, but if the body's not digesting them and absorbing them, then they're not doing their job. So I like to start almost every single person just on digestion protocols, uh, products alone, without any complicated supplements or anything like that. They're going to do some diet changes too. They're going to get off the bad foods in that time. Uh, many of them, the ones that listen. Uh, either way, starting with digestion, then put in the nutrition, then and it, only if necessary, we're going to start talking about detox. We're not going to do a liver flush until they've been topped up on the nutrients for three months. And most of these people, they're not even going to get on the nutrients unless they've done a de uh, digest protocol first. So it, it's an order, digestion, nutrition, then detox. Makes so much sense. Yep. 
I don't even think the body can do it properly if, if it's not nourished. Definitely not with a liver flush. It'll just re reject it. Yeah. Yeah, even in the detox world, we kind of waited on the liver. We kind of like would get in and just start what we called alkalizing and cleaning out the colon and work on the gut. But still, I think people take it to an extreme. That's the problem. And this, so, this information they don't know about. They don't no, know. They don't. Yeah. So this enzyme thing is important. And the raw, that's the one thing that the raw food movement has done correctly. You know, they, they're pumping in enzymes. That's great. But there's no food in the world that's going to have enough nutrients in it unless... You're feeding them entire animals, especially the small animals, because they're easy to do. Uh, wolf it may, it will try and get the bone marrow from a bigger animal like a caribou or something, but their teeth aren't really strong enough to do it, especially yeah. like a moose or something. You can't really break it open without tools, unless you're a hyena. They're, I think, the only animal that can actually successfully break open a bone and lick it out. And they do quite well, to be honest. But so if it were me, I think I would be just using a decent dog food and I would give them some of the human supplements as well, especially the calcium group, a little bit of iodine and omega-3. Right. And it doesn't have to be an omega-3 supplement, but that's easier and probably cheaper, to be honest. And uh, I, would, you, I would dose it based on our human body weight doses. Anyone can talk to us about this, by the way. You can reach out to us. Our contact page is in the link in the description. And Tamara is actually one of the coaches that you could reach out to if you would like to talk about your health or your animal's health. If you buy the eggs that have omega-3 on the label, they're going to have some omega-3 in it because that means they've been fed plants that have omega-3 in it. I would personally use fish oil. It's just, again, easier. It doesn't have to get that complicated. It's just like humans. We need to cover our 90th century nutrients. Not that difficult, not that expensive, especially on smaller dogs. It's This is quite easy to do, to be honest. But if this overwhelms you, in my opinion, you should not have a dog. There's a lot of people who have dogs, and even cats for that matter, who straight up shouldn't, honestly. I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings here or offend anybody, but a lot of us are busy. Like, I know I'm so busy. I, it's not right to an animal. And if it only has limited time outside and everything and limited attention that I can give it, it's don't get a dog, you know. It shouldn't be in an apartment, in my opinion. I have friends with apartment dogs, and it's just, it's not a good life for the animals. Yeah. But, you know, that's a different issue, I guess. But and people, you got to walk them too. Like, even if you do, like, you, they need to get out and sniff the grass and the trees, and it's not fair. They, they can't live in a box. Yeah. We shouldn't either. Right. I know. It's true. And, and you know, we, we've got TV and phones and stuff to entertain us. Cats and dogs don't. It, it's a boring life. They need stimulation, they need love. These are social animals. All social animals need love. They will literally die young. If it, Just like babies, you know, you don't touch the babies. The babies will die. It's crazy. Human babies I'm talking about here. So, yeah, they need stimulation. They need love. And uh, if you can only afford the old Roy dog food, in my opinion, don't get a dog. This is if you're, if you're looking at, you know, well, oh, maybe I want a dog. Oh, I don't realize it's that complicated. Well, yeah, nutrition is pretty complicated. And you can't trust the mainstream for human food or for dog food, in my opinion. And not only that, when your dog gets six, these vet bills are very expensive. <laughs> yeah, they could be more than my car. <laughs> yeah. So if you're not prepared for that, don't do it. Yeah. If you're not prepared to have a, your dog on a supplement regimen, just on top of their regular food, exactly the same that you would do for your food. You, you doesn't matter what you eat. You need to add supplements on top of that. If you're not prepared to handle that cost, don't do it not fair to these animals. And I'm sick of getting animals that are sick. We talked about this last night on the phone. Most of the time when someone brings us a dog or a cat, that animal has very little time left. Very little time left. Humans were incredibly resilient. We literally are a miracle. It's crazy what humans are capable of. We can live on Doritos and Pop Tarts and Pizza Pockets and, and Pepsi and beer. We can live on that for 20, 30 years without getting a major, major health problem. You're not going to be in perfect shape. But even still, we both know plenty of people, I'm sure, that were in their 20s doing whatever they wanted. It didn't catch up with them until they're 30. A 30-year-old <laughs> animal is one of the oldest animals in the world. There's very few animals that reach 30. So we are a miracle. Uh, yeah. But the dogs is really, really not the case there. It's going to show up much, much quicker. And nonetheless, either way, it's going to hit us too. You're not going to lift 80 doing that. And definitely not without pain. You're going to have a serious chronic problem in your 30s or 40s if you eat whatever you want. Well, that's the equivalent. Honestly, the dog foods these days, even though they are supplemented, 
they do have some good stuff in it. Like, it's not all bad. I said at the beginning, you would be better off eating dog food than Doritos, right? Or whatever the, again, Pop-Tarts and all, all that breakfast cereals. You would be better off eating dog food. Dr. Wallach ate dog food through college. That's part of his story. This is before supplements existed, right? That's the truth. There's a lot more nutrients in dog food, and a lot of it is not destroyed by heating. So it's actually a lot better. But still, there's some pretty massive problems here, and it kind of is the qu equivalent of us living on processed foods ourselves. So just recognize that. And if that scares you, then don't do it. Don't get it. Don't get an animal. If you love animals and say this, um, I would encourage people not to just give their dog tap water out of this faucet. A lot of people still do that when That's using another one. and using plastic bowls and make sure you're changing the water every day because it gets that slime, you know. I, people just leave the water out. I mean, that's all That's all helpful to keep your pet healthy. I think that might be part of the reason why almost every single older dog and cat has lumps all over it. That would be the iodine deficiency. Mm. Because yeah, had, there was a lot of cats on here that used to get sick with a hyperthyroid and they'd be licking the cement, just looking for minerals all over the place. This is before I knew. I'm going back and thinking, oh my gosh, all these different cases I had. Didn't understand it like I do now. Fluoride competes for iodine. Mm -hmm. It competes for iodine. So does bromide, but that's another topic for another day. It's in pl in flowers, even if they're gluten-free. Bromide and fluoride compete for iodine. Iodine deficiency is one of the biggest deficiencies in our society. Again, this was recognized literally 100 years ago by everyone. Everyone realized that it was a huge problem, and they actually stepped in. The government stepped in and said, we have to put iodine in, in food and salt flowers we have to throw iodine in here because this is a massive society-wide problem and chlorine competes for iodine as well by the way so there's a lot of people who are like well i don't live in a place that has fluoride in the water it probably has chlorine in the water as well and of course most of our crops are grown in the same water this exacerbates iodine deficiency big time and i think that's one of the biggest problems with animals as well even just adding a, a little bit of extra iodine should make up for that and yeah you have we don't want to drink tap water for ourselves. Why would you feed it to your animal? I know people, a bunch of people are rolling their eyes right now. Well, if you're drinking tap water, then I don't know what you're even doing here on this podcast. To be honest. <laughs> That's true, right? <laughs> yeah, probably not too many of them. But yeah, if you have a filter, just give the animals a filtered water. We have a, a $4,500 hydrogen water machine right now, coupled with a seven-stage reverse osmosis filter. It's the most expensive water I've ever drank. Wow. Give it to the cats too. Right. Why not? Right? We do this for ourselves. It's uh, their animals are living in the same toxic world. We are. They need the same type of protection that we do. So I, th I find this is a problem with horses because they get the hose water and they fill up that big old trough or whatever it's called. And, you know, they they change the water, some at least some of the barns and you know, they're not while run, running free in California, you know, and, you know, land. And they're having a lot of health issues. I feel like the horses are in pretty bad shape, too. And even even worse than the dogs, maybe. It's well, bad. we don't get too many horses. I think their feeds are quite a bit better, to be honest. A lot of oats, a lot of oats and uh, uh, grains in the, some of the feeds. It's kind of the same thing going on. Well, horses do have a much bigger stomach than us. It's only one stomach. They're not a ruminant with four stomachs, but a horse and an elephant have huge stomachs where they actually are better able to digest the grains Yes, it's not exactly their natural diet, but it doesn't harm them as much as it harms us, especially oats, which are relatively low in protein. And of course, it's usually the proteins that are the problems, right? Not just gluten, also gliadin and some of the other proteins are what aggravate the human system and dogs and all that stuff. But I'm just saying some animals with a huge stomach, they are able to handle that a little bit better. Let me touch on this because this is going to be a big thing for a lot of people too. I do recommend a grain-free dog food. There really is no natural correlation for a, do a dog. Can't is never ever going to get wheat, especially like you can't eat raw wheat, right? You have to cook it. You have to pulverize it and then cook it. It's not edible. So there would be no way for a dog to get that. But what I said at the very beginning, we have beaten every animal practically by doing non-natural things. Right. A lot of people think, oh, it's got to be all natural. Well, 
using fire is not natural you know using clothing is not natural i mean we we've hacked some things you know, we we're, we figured some things out and as against grains as we are i don't think that grains themselves are actually the problem i know that's uh, a lot of people just fell out of the chair almost all the longest of populations consume grains this is historical going back to west today price nutrition and physical degeneration and even today and uh this is anomalous for a lot of people. You know, we're against gluten. Well, what do you mean? Is it just because it's GMO? No, 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 no. I don't think it's any of that. I think we're all off track. I think the reason that grains, especially in Western A. Price's studies in the 1920s and the 1930s, he found a bunch of populations who were living well, very well on grains. People in the Swiss mountains, people in the uh, the Outer Hebrides, Scot Scottish islands, they're living on oats there. So what's up? Is it just because the grains have changed? Maybe. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe the GMO is part of it. Probably is. Pesticides, part of it. Okay. But what really I think the difference is in how they actually cultivate the grains. And it's not something that we can easily replicate. The uh, Those same Scottish and, and uh, Swiss people and some of the other populations he looked at, they didn't have any mechanization to harvest the grains. So they would go and cut them and they'd leave them in the fields two, three days, maybe a week. In that time, they've started to ferment. So the chemistry is changing tremendously. This is, I think, a missing piece, right? It's not just the grains. I'm not going to eat grains myself because no one's doing this. I'm not going to grow oats myself. I don't have time for this. But what these populations were doing was not mechanically harvesting their grains and immediately putting them into processing, right? With a big combine that's sucking them all up and getting them into processing right away. No, they would. This is manual work. They would take a whole day to go and cut them down or even multiple days ago and cut them down and they would be sitting in the fields. They would start to ferment at that time. This is before they were milled. Of course, then we ultra mill them. We pulverize them. They bleach them. They, you know, they suck the minerals out and they put a few vitamins back into our modern flowers, whether it's gluten free or not. So it's now a highly processed junk food, basically, again, even if it's gluten free. Well, those people, those enzymes were maturing and probiotics are being produced right it's literally starting to ferment and then even on top of that a lot of them fermented the actual grains beyond that to create fermented grain based foods and they, they ate a lot of this stuff this is not a minor part of their diet at all the huns of people did this up in the huns mountains right i think it's uh is it, i think it's rye that they use up there to make their chapati breads again it's not mechanically processed and it is sitting in the fields and in sitting in big stacks just before it can be processed, it, there's this, you can't do everything all at once when you're doing it manually. That process of, of maturing and fermenting improves the enzyme content, improves the probiotic content, improves the digestibility because this has already started to digest it before we even mill it. Right? It's already started to digest itself, kind of. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Like I still would do grain-free dog food. There still is no natural analog for a dog eating grains. But there's also no natural analog for us eating grains. Yet, the longest of populations, by and large, most of them do eat grains. Yeah. It would be hard to replicate that on a commercial scale. and I, I don't care to. I'm doing fine without grains. I don't even eat rice. Mm. I had some rice yesterday. <laughs> it's not outlawed to us. It's just I, I wanted <laughs> to see how I was one. doing without rice. We, there yeah, was yeah. That, um, there's that Australian lady who's been going viral on many platforms now and she's a she's a health person right. i'm sorry i don't remember her name uh but she made a post that rice starts to grow mold within 24 hours even if you put it in the fridge so i saw that and i was like Ugh, man i usually make rice for a whole week i'm lazy. Oh. you know make it for a whole week and I, i'm not gonna make rice before every meal this is i'm just gonna quit rice i just yeah. stopped eating rice and switched to potatoes yeah i probably have maybe once a month if that not even a little little bit so it's not a big deal. I, I know as a, as a vegan, I think I was having it almost every day, like the brown rice or every other day for a while. Well, maybe you don't just just don't make a week's worth at a time. <laughs> it, it should be <laughs> fine. I, I, eat, I eat very differently now. <laughs> I've seen uh, I know we're kind of wrapping up here. I've seen uh, people feeding cats rice. You were talking about vegan animals and stuff like that. And then. Yeah, there's a uh, people that are that believe that that dogs can also be on just fruit. And yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's abuse. 
or just a vegan diet, which also like a lot of these V dog foods, you know, that's, that's being pushed really big right now. They need organs like we do. This is, these are yeah. the superfoods, the real superfoods. I agree. Organs, connective yeah. tissue. That's what I was saying. Those byproducts, right? People are like, oh, but they feed them byproducts. That's the most valuable stuff of the animal. It's the stuff that they don't sell in the grocery store. We're lucky if we can buy just liver in the grocery store, maybe hearts, maybe chicken kidneys you can find. Where's the brain? Where's the eyes? Where's the ears? Where's the tongue? Yeah. A lot of other cultures, they eat this stuff. They eat the stomach lining. They eat the whole animal. They they drain the blood. They cook with the blood. It's my favorite dish in the entire world. Dinaguan. Blood you know, stew. that makes sense, but if I'm, I could be mistaken, but I think what I remember when I was researching this, I think some of the byproducts, I think what people were saying is they put euthanize i don't know if they're still doing it this was back but they were putting in euthanized in down animals and that gets into that i don't know with tumors i don't again this was a long time ago and yeah i've been doing this a long time so i don't have all the details but i'm i want to go back and look at that because i'm curious about um the process of what their byproducts are so I, I feel like they did something strange with that process it wasn't just about the scraps but i could be wrong well Okay, I'm interested, but in general, I'm saying what we call scraps is the most valuable part of the. Yeah, yeah. And now there's a little bit of demand for organs and and hearts and stuff, so they sell it to us. But I want the brain, I want the blood, I want yeah. it. Like I said, my favorite dish ever, blood stew. It's called dinaguan for the uh, the uh, Filipinos. They call it dinaguan. The what is it? Dinaguan, dinaguan. Is it made out of blood? They cook Just blood. Oh, okay. They, they cook the meat in the blood. Okay. Blood stew. They might also call it chocolate meat. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. It's, <laughs> it's glorious, actually. It makes your brain buzz. Really? I made a, I, we used to have a Filipino restaurant right beside our little store in Windsor, Ontario. Uh -huh. It's since changed to an Indian restaurant. But, oh, my gosh, I loved it so much. I made all my friends try it. None of them wanted to eat it. I said, you have to eat this. You just have to try it. And it, all of them were like, Wow. Really? Wow. Well, you were vegan. You probably remember the first time you ate a steak after you were vegan. It took me a while, Ryan. I'm not going to lie. When I first had eggs, I cried. It was on my birthday and I <laughs> cried. I cried like a, I mean, I was also a hot mess because I was spiraling out of control, but I cried for three days and I was like, I just remember crying and saying, I don't want to eat animals or eggs. It was hard for me. It really was. It you really remember your brain me. feeling good though? Your body feeling good? I remember feeling, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the supplements definitely helped. Um, I know um, uh, Dr. Reese was trying to go, you just need to go eat some liver. I was like, I'm not doing that. I couldn't <laughs> do it. I was like, nope, I can't do it. All right, just do the eggs. And it was, it was hard. So it was a process. I think it took me about maybe five months before I, and I had to call my friend. I said, I need your help. I need you to help me eat a beef, grass-fed beef patty. She's like, okay, I'm coming over. <laughs> I needed help. I really it was that it was that hard for me. But did you feel good after? Yes, I feel the best that I've ever felt in a long time. And I don't even think I realized that I wasn't feeling like I could feel better. You know what I mean? And the last, I'd say, five years has kind of been a struggle for me health wise, you know, and I was just frustrated because I was like, what is going on? I don't eat like all these people. And you know, the, when I lost my brain, though, that was the scariest thing for me on top of everything else. I lost my, my, my brain. I couldn't remember. I remember looking at a picture of my brother. He's got seven kids and I couldn't name their names. I would find myself driving and not know where I am. Like it was really scary. And I was having, you know, palpitations. I'd have to get on the floor and put my legs up on the wall. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I mean, it was really scary. I'm, I'm really grateful for, for Dr. Reese giving me this information and sending me, you know, down this path and this, you know, because uh, I think I would have stroked out, honestly. It's a yeah. possibility. Yeah. <laughs> so, so all I was saying is that good feeling that you get after you haven't eaten meat in, in a long time, especially red meat, times yeah, that, need it. Times that by 10 or 20. Whoa. Right? Yeah. It sounds like an adrenochrome. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's unreal. It really, I know it sounds weird to some people, whatever. I was vegan too. I remember For how abs long? Abs not that long, not that I started to fall apart real quick. My, really? I was only 23, 22, 23. Wow. I saw food Inc. Whenever that came okay. out. Yeah. So I was probably 2021 20, when that came out, went vegetarian. 
and uh, I was kind of a, a weird vegetarian. I, I would eat meat if somebody, like I was invited to dinner and they made it or something like that, but I didn't buy meat, but I did eat eggs and cheese. And when I cut eggs out, because I started dating a vegan girl and she called uh, cheese the cheater's meat. She was hardcore, you know, hardcore. Yeah. So cut that out. My hair started falling out immediately. Wow. I, I started to, I already had serious health problems, but I started to get yeah. even worse. At 22, 23 years old, I was considering getting a cane, walking with a cane. Okay. Wow. I was an old man. I dressed like an old man. I looked like an old man. I had a hunchback. And mm. uh, it was super, super bad. But when I pulled the eggs out, uh, yeah, just way, yeah, egg- way worse. But I remember, yeah. I know I'm a little bit off topic here, but uh, I worked in the Sydney. We're in Australia here at this time in the Sydney Harbor. And once a month, we had to go around on the boat and collect samples from all over the harbor. Big harbor. It took us two days to do it, sometimes three days if it rained. And on mm. one side of the harbor, the only place that we could stop for lunch was a burger place. And, you know, I'm stubborn, like, no, I'm not going to eat it and everything. But uh, my buddy, Captain, you know, the guy that I'm working with there, he, he'd bug me. Just, uh, you know, you want some, you know, you want some. And then one day I was like, oh, <laughs> he's like, I'll buy you one. Oh, man, he bought me that burger. It was so good. And they put beets on it. I don't know. Australians put uh, pickled beets on everything. It's fantastic. Huh. You know, pickled beets on on burgers. It, they, a burger. yeah. they know what they're doing Sour there. Crap. Oh, my gosh. But so anyways. So I found myself literally the entire month dreaming about that burger, dreaming about it, salivating about it, wow. you know, because I'm not letting myself I'm, I'm in the vegan for the same sort of reason as you. It's political. Yeah. Not I wasn't it's not yeah. for health. It's just like, yeah. oh, wow, the food system is really bad and all this stuff. Right. I did love animals, but it was really just more about the food system being bad. And I'm yeah. stubborn. I'm doing this. I'm doing it. You know, but then, yeah, that I was just the only time each month I would let myself eat that meat was on that one day. That was my excuse. It's the only place we can stop. It's a long day. Okay, I'll do it because I was just getting French fries, you know, for the first couple of months. And I'm like, this is not enough. I'm starving out here, you know, but yeah, finally allowed myself to have that meat. Started dreaming about that burger. And then me and that girl broke up. And the first thing I did was go down and get a meat lovers pizza from Pizza Hut immediately as I didn't care hilarious yeah, yeah but anyways so i've been i've had the pleasure of being there with three four maybe five vegans that i was the one that convinced them to eat meat and to eat steak for the first time in however long two five years yeah. and all of them yeah you watch them just go wow and i know what they're feeling they're feeling that wave come across them like oh man this is like my whole body's getting massaged my yeah. brain is buzzing again crank that to 10 or 20 times for the blood yeah. stew blood soup amazing and okay so here ra- wrapping this up i'm trying okay. to find blood in my town that i live in and you know there's a farm town you know 30 minutes away so i'm trying to find blood what's with the blood and here in, in houston they sell everything under the sun anything that you can think that you would ever want to buy you can buy it here in houston in fact there's probably a gigantic store for it you like golf you'll find the biggest golf store you'll ever see here you know whatever it is that you like you like pets you like fish there's there's fish depots department stores Size of Walmart, full of fish. And it's crazy. You know, we got Costco's, we got Walmarts, we got we got everything. We got Burlington Coat Factories. Anything you can name, you can buy it here times 10. You know, there's no problem finding it, but I can't find blood. Can't get blood. Where's the blood? We're trying to go to the Asian grocery stores and stuff. Where the heck is the blood? Well, I'm even asking my farmer friends up north. They say we sell it to pet food companies. We sell it to pet food companies because I believe that the blood is more valuable than anything. It, even more than the bones. I mean, there's some, there's some yeah, gold I pulled inside. Some, I pulled some cats around with just liver and liver blood. That's what I fed them for days to get them kind of from the hole. You'll probably the- see them lick it, right? They, they'll lick well, the blood right off. When they get really sick, you kind of have to force feed them to save their life. Um, yeah, and it, but it does bring them out of it, man. Yeah, for sure. Blood is gold. I mean, these things, yeah. the organs, the connective tissue, the bones, the bone marrow, and the blood. The blood is usually left out of the conversation unless we're talking about the Maasai who drink the blood, right? The the men, the warriors, they're on an almost entirely blood diet. Wow. Blood and, and raw milk. Wow. Crazy. So yeah, it's super, super valuable stuff. And I just always thought it was interesting since I've learned this, that what do we do? We give them to animals. Because yeah. animals, by law, need to have more nutrients in the food. Even if there's problems with the food, which there is, they still have to have more in it. And one of the ways that they crank that up is blood. Wow. Interesting. 
I so I would did. give my animals blood. And when we're talking about giving them whole animals, like I would give them whole rabbits yeah. and whatever. It's because yeah. they get the blood, they get the liver, they get the bones, they get all the yeah. most valuable parts of the animal, not just the muscle. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's why I do like the little Cornish hens too, because the bones are a little more fragile for little dogs to be able to eat too, like mm -hmm. the little tips, you know? Yeah. And they can eat mice whole, right? And they can yeah, they can't actually, you know, it's interesting. I was having some clients do that for their cats. There are some mice companies that I guess they sell them for snakes. Oh, that... For snakes, they're stuffed with vitamins and minerals. Yep. Right. So I was encouraging people, if, if you're comfortable with it, like go buy your frozen. I had a friend and she actually lives near you and at Houston, around Houston somewhere. And she was buying some uh, frozen mice for her cat. Yeah. Good idea. Absolutely. And then if I had a cat, I, that's what I would, I mean, I don't want a cat right now. I'm, I've got these, I don't ever get to pick my animals. They come to me, but that's what I would do <laughs> for sure. Start them early. <laughs> Briefly. I wanted to mention one more problem. Yeah. I think that neutering the animals is problematic first of all, but more so is doing it so, so young early. Yeah. You know, it's, I understand, like, I have a lot of rescuer friends and I, I understand it's like, they'll, they'll do it because they're so sick of the pet overpopulation. They're so sick of all these animals that don't have homes. And I, you know, I get it. They always want to get the dogs fixed before they home them. But I really, I really do. I really am starting to talk about the fact that, you know, it really does cause more issues in the long run for their health when you do it so early, for sure. I think you know. even later, it's even weird that we call it fixed, right? Like it was broken before. Yeah. There's a couple vets that are doing, they're doing some other, I don't know if it's like a vasectomy, but they're doing a different type of um, fixing, I guess. I was kind of looking into what that was a few years ago, but you know, I, I've never had, I mean, I've always had rescue dogs. So very few that I've actually had to fix. I mean, years ago, yes. When I had my rescue, but you, you know, you get them fixed coming out of the shelter. They won't let you adopt one of the shelter without doing it, you know, because of the pet overpopulation problem. But yeah, it, I I mean, I feel like, I feel like you should wait as long as you can. If you're responsible, don't do it at all. But there's also the problem too, like where I live, I'm in Los Angeles. And if you've got an unfixed dog and you're somewhere, it causes other dogs to get aggressive. So it's, I think it's a more of a safety issue than it is a health, you know, and then a lot of these people are, they're saying that if you don't fix your dogs, like if you don't spay your, your female dog, it's going to get pyometra later on, which I totally don't buy. Makes no sense to me, you know? So they're trying to use medical things to get dogs fixed, but I really just think it's part of the overpopulation agenda. That's my theory, at least. Nature's not stupid. I don't buy that right? either. Right? Yeah. It's like, I mean circumcision and stuff I mean, it's, it's like, it's like are, are you having a baby are you going to give your little daughter uh you know whatever <laughs> yeah, your cheeks gonna... tied so that you know what i mean like no and the equivalent would be like yeah tying the tubes on your like three-year-old or something right yeah for health reasons <laughs> like come yeah. on <laughs> they're not going to develop properly and they, they might be retarded honestly <laughs> i know sense. i know a lot of people don't like that word but man i'm sick of seeing retarded animals out there oh my my little chihuahua was a little retarded he passed away this year and he had some major issues like he did. There's nothing sadder than a dumb cat or dog. These are supposed to be quite smart animals, you know, yeah. that's why yeah. they're good companions. Yeah, I agree. At your, at your very least, let it be an six, adult. They say six, like the going thing is like at least six or seven months. I'm like, what, you know, at least over two, like let them let them develop normally. You know, I've seen it in weeks, especially with kittens. Weeks. Yeah. They're weeks. They, they've done eight, yeah, they've done eight weeks. They'll they'll, they'll uh, fix a an animal that's a, a baby in some of these rescues. That's why I kind of pulled out of the animal rescue thing. Plus, like I stopped donating just because I didn't like what they were doing. I can't. I don't want to put my money toward like a lot of these uh, rescues are using for Brecto on their dogs, and you know, I just I can't do it anymore. <laughs> you know, I pulled out of of that whole field. It's a bit of a weird situation because yeah, a lot of especially municipalities are are mandating this stuff. You're talking about the vaccines like, wow, what what precedent is there for this? Did we have an epidemic of infectious disease with animals anyways in the first place? I mean, that's the, we don't have to debate whether the thing, the injectables yeah. work or not. Just right. like, did we have a problem in the first place? I don't think we did. No, 
No, I mean, I know like, you know, they push the big, the parvo, you don't want a dog to get parvo or, you know, just temper, you know, I mean, I know those, those things happen. I have my own theory about how, why they happen, but it's just a theory, you know, I can't, it's just my own thing. We'll do some uh, terrain theory episodes here. I've got a couple coming up to be honest. And yeah, I don't, oh. I don't believe in any of this stuff, honestly. Yeah. I feel like there's still a lot we don't know. I think I was reading, uh, what was that one book that came out last? Oh gosh, what's it called? Anyway, I was talking about like someone who ended up getting rabies and dying. And then someone, I don't know, years later, the guy came back and found out that guy had died of rabies and got rabies. I think there's something else to disease that we just haven't tapped into. I, I agree. I, That's a discussion for another day. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, I, last thing I kind of wanted to mention here. So when I was looking up the oldest dogs in the world, I came up with those two. We got we had Bobby from Portugal, which um, I thought was interesting that the uh, son was talking about how uh, his dad was a hunter, um, which I just thought was interesting because, you know, and, you know, hunting dogs, they're out in the woods yeah. for days on end, usually. They probably are going to be able to eat some of those organs. The hunter's just going to let them eat some of the organs. You know, they're butchering the meat for themselves. And here, a dog, have this, have this. So they're also getting fresh blood. And they're also getting bones. The hunter's going to have bones laying around. They're also going to be allowed to drink puddles and stuff. And um, as I was looking at where this dog lived here on uh, rural Portugal, I'm thinking, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, this dog is probably going to have wood ashes here. I mean... And this is in modern times now. This wasn't that long ago that this dog mm. died. And uh, I just bet a lot of this these places here are using wood still. And if not, they're going into the woods to do the hunting. They're probably having campfires there and stuff. And just yeah. saying, this is a supplement to its diet. The dog will eat the wood ashes and and uh, whatever else. It also probably had quite a free life, was probably able to run around. Like This is very rural here. The, the streets are going all over the place. It's not a you know cookie cutter suburb type thing. I bet it just had, it had a good life, exercise, fresh air, love, all yeah. this stuff. Probably wasn't cell phone towers here until recently. Again, it looks kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so that's interesting. And then the other, you know, now it's gone back to the Guinness record holder, Bluey, who died in 1939, lived to 29 mm -hmm. years old. Well, that was before EMF became a huge problem. There was no cell phone towers. There was no Wi-Fi. There was no high voltage power lines. There was no dog food industry before yeah. that you know so probably was on raw diet and getting those other sources that a, a peasant type of primitive type of person right. would, would have a homesteading type of person they have other mineral sources we've gone into that elsewhere in other episodes just saying that that dog would have been eating a very similar thing a very mm -hmm. similar diet so the 1939 one is no surprise this new one in portugal had to have some other mineral sources i do believe and what i thought was interesting was when I popped in the oldest cat in the world, the current Guinness Book record is a uh, a Maine Coon. I guess that's a breed named Cream Puff. She was born in 1967, died in 2005. That's the ripe old age of 38 years old. Whew. Wow. Red and, one. Uh, yeah. So this was when I said I'm kind of adjusting the way I'm thinking about things. So apparently she was eating dry commercial cat food supplemented by home cooked breakfast, eggs, bacon, turkey, bacon, broccoli, coffee with cream. What? <laughs> yeah, I know. I was what? That's exactly what I said. Wait, what? And up there it says red wine, a dropper red of red wine. Red wine. An eye yeah. dropper of red wine every other day. The owner knows how to live. Yeah. And asparagus. Yeah, I mean, I mean, well, these, these couple, are pretty good. I've known foods. a couple of cats to live to thirty that I've known, but not thirty-eight. That's pretty long. Thirty-eight is extreme. A lot of humans are struggling to get to thirty-eight these days. True. I don't yeah. mean to like not die before thirty-eight, but not doing well. Yeah. So yeah, this was interesting to me. So we got you know the dry dog, uh, dry cat food that does have extra nutrients in it, even since 1967, well-established, but lots of nutrients in dry cat food, but then it's getting some real food as well. And this is breaking our rules because we yeah. would always say, don't give them table scraps because that throws off the nutrient balance. The nutrient balance is perfect in food. We've said this before. I'm correcting on record here. I'm correcting myself. I no longer believe this. Actually, yeah. I think that we should add more nutrients 
And I don't know what else was done for this animal. I don't know if they, this cream puff went out and ate mice and birds and whatever. I don't know. A lot of times they just kill it and they don't eat it. I have no idea. Just saying, I found it very interesting that this cat was actually getting some real food here. And it got red wine and coffee. <laughs> never coffee. heard of that. <laughs> coffee. Ne never in my life have I heard of this. Coffee. Very, my kind very of cat. Strange. <laughs> Actually, okay, now we know. I should have gone through and looked this up earlier. Austin, Texas. Austin, oh, Texas is wow, where this okay. cat lived. So not the lowest nutrient part of America. Right. Definitely not the highest. Pretty odd case here. I'm betting this cat got a lot of love. Yeah, uh, betting it had uh, quite a bit of freedom. Mm -hmm. And it's 1967 to 2005. You know, honestly, I'll bet there was no Wi Fi in that house at all. 2005, Wi Fi was kind of just becoming a thing. We had hardwire when I was a kid, and you know, we didn't get Wi Fi until a little bit later after 2005. Mm. I mean, it just, I don't know, all, all of the factors that have gotten a lot worse right now, at least in terms of EMF probably wasn't a factor in this cat's life yeah and uh, yeah, i'm interested in cases like this so basically take everything with a grain of salt you can take some of this advice and you can modify it to your own circumstances i would personally be using I, i've kind of said a few different things here but i don't have all the money in the world i'm not rich right and yeah. if it was right now I had no other choice and the dog can't somehow if someone gave me a dog or a cat. Honestly, I probably would just buy it a decent dog food, decent cat food, and I would give it extra supplements, the same human supplements that I take. I would adjust them down for the body weight and I would supplement them with some raw whole animals from mice on up. I would probably not feed it a steak ever. I know some insane people. You might be one of them, Tamara, who've done this, getting them T-bone steaks and stuff like, are you insane? No, no. way. Just money wise, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. No, no, no. no, no. Gee, I'd rather give them old right. And, but no. I've I also just... recommended, by the way, that people who do have sick dogs and cats, like I said, we usually don't have very much time with them at all. Often it's like one, two, three days the do the dog dead before they come to us, right? I don't know. They wait too long, or dogs no. and cats, especially cats, they can fail very quickly when they start to fail. No. So a lot of times, yeah, as we get a message, hey, can you help me with my cat? By the time I answer them, the cat's dead. So mm -hmm. I've recommended they go to the agricultural store and buy selenium shots for, made for a baby goat, baby goat, baby pig, baby lamb, because we talked about selenite before. There's only a few key, key, key nutrients, right? I know there's 90 essential nutrients, but they are getting a trace mineral complex in their, in most pet foods, especially from the blood. It's, it's going to have trace minerals in it. And uh, so that's kind of covered. A few of them will be disrupted by heat. I do think actually selenium is one of them. And yeah, that selenite that you brought to my attention, that's that's toxic. Sodium yeah, selenite. I didn't I didn't know about that till this year because I have a, a mentor who's in Australia. She works with horse issues at veterinary acupuncturist. And she was like, you know, I'm, ca I'm calling these companies to tell them, like, what are you doing? You're that's toxic for these animals. Like and even some of these uh, some of these branded raw freeze dried ones are, are putting it in there. The high the what the canned foods that you're paying a good penny for have it in there. I was really shocked. So you can, from an agricultural store, you can buy a selenium shot. You can buy a thiamine shot, B1 we were talking about earlier. But I would honestly just give them a human supplement, B-complex. Why not? We sell we sell them, we take them, give a, give a dose to the animal, do the math for the body weight. One serving per 100 pounds. Most animals weigh less than 100 pounds. And yeah, for, for animals that are especially not doing well, I would do a selenium shot myself personally. And if the... Uh, dog food, cat food, or whatever didn't have selenium in it. You can add selenium to their food. You can, you can just buy a regular selenium supplement. But if you're if your animals on death's door, I would be using a selenium shot. I've recommended this several times. Go to the agricultural store, see what injections they got. They, get, they will have selenium. That's a guarantee. Buy that. They probably will have thiamine. Buy that. What else do they have? Go ahead and buy it because it'll get right into the blood. Animals have digestion problems just like we do, especially living on processed foods. Put it right in the blood. Bypass sure. digestion. It's pretty cheap. The stuff's not very expensive. You know, nutrients, uh, supplements start to cost more when we talk about packaging and distribution and customer service and all the stuff that's behind a human supplement company. Agricultural store, you'd be blown away. A lot of the stuff is very, very cheap.
So yeah. easy to do, easy to save your animal. In some in, in some cases, you have a chance at least. You yeah. have a chance of doing it that way. Yeah. And uh, yeah, other than that, I mean, some big problems, these injectables. I don't know why any animal or human or anything ever needed 15 different you know, vaccinations or anything like that. That's yeah. seems to be just the thing, a money grab, you know, something that was never necessary, solving a problem that never existed in the first place and creating new problems. And other than that, it shouldn't really be that complicated, to be honest. Give them love. Sure. Let them go I mean, outside. I feel like when certain ha animals ha are going through something, it does help to give them a protocol, though, <laughs> sometimes, you know, like I my mean, dog needed it for sure. Well, I think they should be on a protocol all the time, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Why not? The, avoid these problems in the first place. And, you know, you said it with the tap water. Anything you would do for yourself, do it for your animals because they're exposed to the same things. You want them to live a long time? That's what you have to do. There's a lot of people who just kind of don't care. I'm not, I'm not bashing them at all. Like, you know, I, I get it. Just a yeah. dog is a dog. It's uh, if it lives to six, that's what it is. And we get a new dog. Not a huge deal. That's fine. Feed them the old Roy. Then, you know, just don't expect them to live to 18, 19. And if they do get arthritis or diabetes or something, a lot of people are just prepared to shoot it. You know, I live in the country, right? They get, oh. you get wow. diabetes, the dog's getting shot. We're not paying $5,000 for whatever. You you said it, vet bills. You live in LA, okay? These are different lifestyles. Out in the deep country, a dog has arthritis, a dog has cancer, a dog has something, and the vet, sa vet says, yeah, it's going to be $7,000 to fix it. A bullet costs a dollar. Wow. You know, and that's that's what the decision is for for a lot of people. I'm just saying, if that's you, then I know. that's you. You can't you. do that in LA. It was, I think, it was eight hundred dollars when I put down my last pet. Eight hundred. <laughs> yeah. Like, what? <laughs> no, we're not even paying for that. No way. I got well. I got the ashes too because you know Ugh. it's still eight hundred dollars. Yeah. No. What no. happened? <laughs> yeah. Bullet is quick. Yeah. Just, just saying. I mean, there's different attitudes towards pet care yeah. and stuff like that. A lot of people don't expect their cats to live. Cats, by the way, oh my gosh, we give they give them away by the box up north. You know, really? you want a cat? You want another cat? We got another. You want a box cats? Pick a cat. <laughs> you know, what do you, these wow. are barn. These are barn cats, right? Wow. So yeah, they're giving them away. They're they're begging you, please take some cats. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I I understand the argument to neuter them and stuff. I know it's got. There, I think yeah, there's more cats too. in this world than humans, to be honest. I do do. I'm just I'm I'm hoping that the information comes out at least to do the uh one that's not you know gonna alter their health the way that you know it's doing now. Yeah, I'd rather have the cat have a good life, you know, no no, no matter what. That's just... For sure. Don't poison it. Gosh. <laughs> right. which, which is what we're doing anyways. Yeah. We, yeah. we need to be diligent for ourselves. We need to be diligent for our animals as well. Hey, Frankie. <laughs> Any <laughs> closing words, Tamara? Um, no, um, thank you for having me. That I've enjoyed this conversation. I've, you know, I've always wanted to, um, you know, have this discussion about the animals and... Um, you know, hopefully this uh, helps people with their pets. It's pretty yeah. easy to fill up two hours and we didn't even touch on a lot of different species. Oh, there's so much. Yeah. <laughs> Animals are interesting. I always found them interesting. Kind of wish yeah. that I could uh, have stayed in the animal industry instead of humans. I, you know, I don't want anybody to uh, feel bad about that. It's just it's hard to work with humans. Oh, my gosh. You know what? Can I just say really quick? When I first even got into being a health coach, I used to, my passion was animals. Like I don't want to work with people. Ah, people. I want to do pets. But when you start working with the pets, you're still working with the people. Mm. Actually, actually, it's sometimes for me it's actually harder because they're like, oh, it's my little baby. You know what I mean? And <laughs> now I'm like, oh, it's it's really no different. Or I found that when I started working with the animals, a lot of people care more about their animals than themselves that it went into them. So then I started doing their whole family. Like I'd be working with the animals and them. They started going, well, you know what? I see how they're doing better. Why aren't I doing this for myself? And I love that. I love that. You know? Yeah, you're right. That's the flip side of what I was saying earlier. There's a lot of people still, even in the country, to be honest, that will yeah. pay that $5,000 vet bill. But when you're talking about 100, 200 bucks a month for their own health, they're like, I don't know yeah. if I can do it, you know? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's an interesting situation. And just, yeah. you know, my closing words here, too, is that I, I wish I had applied what I knew from the pet business to myself, because mm -hmm. I, I genuinely learned that it was abuse to not give your animals supplements. Meanwhile, I had stiff man syndrome and childhood arthritis and and, you know, Tourette's sy symptoms and cramps and twitches, couldn't sleep, headaches, 
you know, it's migraine, stomach pains, I had all these different problems that it, I swear I could have just read the label of the snake powder and put two and two together. Like, oh, if I don't give the snakes this powder, yeah. they get spinal problems and muscle problems and they die. Yeah. Well, I guess I, I guess I need that too, right? What That's we exactly didn't know, but Ryan, you're able to teach people and, and help so many people because of what you went through, you know? Absolutely. And now we know the animals need the same darn things that we do Yep, for, for the sure. most part, a yeah. little, little bit of different ratios, kind of not honestly, not even that it's not that technical. It's mostly the same. Yeah, it is. All right. So I appreciate you a ton, Tamara. I've enjoyed this talk a lot. Yeah, me too. Hope the audience enjoyed it as well. And Tamara's information is actually going to be in the description as well. You can reach out to her. She is qualified to help you with your health, just like we are, like we normally do. She's absolutely on the same level there and with your pets as well. And now you've met her. Now you know her. She's a, she's a good <laughs> coach. She's a caring coach. You're in good hands with her. Yeah. Thank and you. Having said that, remember that you can find everything that I do on my website, notusbooks.org, including the books that I've written and helped publish the free audiobook versions of my books and video book versions, all the social media links, got hundreds of book reviews there. Um, they're almost all of them are about health as well. There's also an archive of this podcast on the website, notusbooks.org. On the archive version, you can download them for free. And there's actually a special treat there all the way at the end. So those of you who are listening on the archive right now, stick around after I sign out, get your special treat. And if you'd like to support this podcast directly, you can do so on Patreon, patreon.com slash the real not us as little as a dollar 99 a month gets you access to all the content that's there. All of the podcast episodes go up early on Patreon, at least one week early. Sometimes several weeks early if I'm on top of things. And right now I am on top of things. Things are up there quite early. There's some videos that have been banned from YouTube and so on. You know, YouTube hates vitamins and minerals apparently. So <laughs> some of that stuff is on the Patreon as well. We also do a weekly Zoom meeting, the distributors and I, where we go pretty deep into different health problems and products and case studies. All those meetings are on the Patreon as well. And we appreciate the support either way. And other than that, thank you once again, everybody. Stay healthy, my friends. Until next time. Bye. <laughs>